half no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, I'm just... Mm. Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. Is that on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning to you. It is six o'clock on Friday the 24th of November. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning... Families on tenterhooks. A four-day truce has started in Gaza with the first Hamas hostages and prisoners of Israel set to be freed this afternoon. Suella sticks her oar in. The former Home Secretary calls on the government to act now after record net migration figures with pressure also piling on the Prime Minister from within his own cabinet. And riots in Dublin. Violence breaks out following an attack that left a five-year-old girl seriously injured. It's looking brighter for the end of the week, but colder, so much colder. All the details coming up shortly. Well, thank you very much indeed, Joe. If you are just waking up, all the headlines this morning, the front page of The Times, migration figures pile pressure on the Prime Minister to at The Daily Telegraph says cabinet pressure on Sunak to slash immigration. And also in the Daily Mail, this is a really interesting one, Suella Braverman leading a Tory revolt Another here. Another one. Another one. This is a woman scorned. Yes, she has described the net migration figures that were released yesterday by the Office for National Statistics as a slap in the face. Uh, another attack on Rishi Sunak, pressure within his cabinet. I mean, you could ask, Suella so Bravman was Home Secretary. She was in charge of this for a long time. Is it a bit rich for her to be complaining now? Well, well it's, a, it's a really interesting point, this. She says that she pushed Sunat repeatedly for an annual cap on migration. He refused. Actually, I said she was a woman scorned. She took to Twitter last night, or X, or whatever we call it these days. But she said, just in terms of the numbers, 1.3 million people coming here in two years. That's a city the size of Birmingham. And I think she makes a great point. Where are the schools? Where are the hospitals? Where's the infrastructure? And obviously, this is going to be a massive problem for the Conservative Party, on the back of the autumn statement, where I think uh, they thought they were on the front foot, they're very much on the back foot. And Downing Street says the number remains too high. So Keir Starmer has said it is shockingly high, and Suella Braverman, as we were discussing, says enough is enough. What are they going to do about it? We're going to be discussing that on the programme. Uh, we're also going to be hearing from the former Home Secretary, uh, Priti Patel. She said she believes the government has lost control of the issue of immigration. Do you agree? That is one of our questions we're asking you uh, to get in touch with us about this morning on the programme. Mm. Also, later on in the programme, we're going to be talking about uh, this this shock win, I suppose, uh, of uh, Gert Wilders in the Netherlands. Uh, there's a wave of general election wins from what are deemed to be far-right parties. I'm just wondering this morning, uh, how do you feel about that? Is, is there change in the air? Do you sense that there is political change? Is the far-right, or the rise of the far-right, as it's being deemed in the papers, is it inevitable? Let us know. Uh, you can email us, talktoday at talk.tv. Tweet us at talktv. You can also text the word talk and your message to 8722. Now, though, it is time for the headlines with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning to you, Emily. Good morning. Well, in the last hour, a four day pause in fighting in Gaza and the process to release Israeli and Palestinian hostages has begun. The temporary ceasefire is the first in almost seven weeks of fighting, and later we should see the first 13 hostages being released by Hamas. Under the deal, which was struck with Israel, 50 women and children, as well as around 150 Palestinian prisoners, are expected to be freed. And in a meeting with the new Foreign Secretary, Lord David Cameron in Jerusalem. The Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he's hopeful the planned release will go ahead. Uh, we hope to get uh, our hostages out. Uh, it's uh, not without its uh, challenges, but we have to. We hope to get this first uh, tranche out, and then we're committed to getting everyone out. But we'll continue with our war aims, uh, namely to uh, uh, eradicate Hamas. 
The police chief in Dublin has blamed lunatics and hooligans that are driven by the far right for widespread unrest and violent scenes in the city centre. Several vehicles, including a police car, were set alight during clashes with officers yesterday evening, which was sparked following the stabbing of a woman and three children earlier in the afternoon. A five-year-old girl remains in emergency care this morning after the attack. A man's died after armed police were called to a house in Dagenham in East London last night. Officers say they tried to negotiate with the man who said he was armed before shots were fired by police. Leading ferry company Carnival is being accused of planning to fire and then rehire more than 900 members of staff if they don't accept new terms and conditions. The Nautilus Union says the firm, which owns p Cruises and Cunard, has no real intention of engaging in meaningful negotiations and has asked them to withdraw the threat. And Amazon workers are going on strike today to coincide with Black Friday, one of the company's busiest shopping days of the year. More than 1,000 staff at the firm's warehouse in Coventry are staging a walkout in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. But the online retailer, retail giant has insisted that customers will not be affected by the industrial action. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. So are you keen on Black Friday deals? Is, is this a time when you run out to the shops? Well, actually, this year I'm being way more careful after several warnings from consumer groups like Witch, who have said that most of the deals, or a lot of them, in fact, are mm. not genuine. And perhaps six weeks ago, we would have seen the prices that we're seeing today. So in the past, yes, but this year I'm being a lot more sensible. I'm trying to get organised and do my Christmas shopping, well though, done. make the most of the mm. deals that are genuine deals. And actually, Black Friday, I mean, it's black two weeks, yeah. really, isn't it? I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So, so, so it's really interesting. I lived in the States for a while, and Black Friday was absolutely massive, and then Cyber Monday, and then, obviously, it's caught, over, caught on over here as well. So when they say, as the Americans sneeze, we catch a cold over here. Well, yeah, and you remember... Well, <laughs> I, I've clearly caught it. Um, you, 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 you definitely <laughs> caught it. I think but we've all had that. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid so. Uh, but you remember those scenes that we had over here some years ago when Black Friday was first introduced, of these stampedes yes. in big But we're expecting that less this year because of the cost of living crisis. Mm. So forecasts are expected to be a lot lower this year, just mm. generally. On the subject of forecasts, <laughs> Emily, thank you. Oh, That's very nice. Joe. I like that. <laughs> Emily set me up there. Uh, Joe, hello to you. What's the weather looking like? Well, it's not quite a winter wonderland, but, of course, we've got a lot of Christmas light switch-ons this week and uh, quite a few Christmas markets as well. And all I can say is wrap up warm. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, we're starting with quite a range of temperatures across the country, around 2 degrees Celsius in the north, 12 or 13 down in the south, because it has been quite mild. But instead, we're going to see this northerly drive, so air coming down from the Arctic, bringing much, much colder conditions, certainly for today and also for Saturday. Sunday looks like being a slightly milder day, but that's only a brief respite. The cold air returns again next week. So as far as uh, starting today is concerned, we've got a few wintry showers over Scotland. There's a falling as snow. We've got some rain showers as well for eastern parts of Scotland and a few of those coming very close to eastern coasts. Now the wind direction is going to be crucial over the next 24 hours in terms of where those showers are actually going to make landfall and the fact that the isobars were very close together means it is going to be very windy on that eastern coast and so not only do we have low temperatures but we've also got a fairly significant wind chill. So even though the sun might be out in places it is going to feel very chilly. So as in best temperatures, we're looking at uh, single figures for most places, perhaps double down towards the southwest. Through the course of the day, we see cloud moving away from southwestern areas, so a widespread frost developing tonight. And again, those showers, again, close to those eastern coasts, particularly for parts of Yorkshire, Lincolnshire, down into East Anglia as well, also affecting eastern parts of Scotland. Very, very windy up to the north. And again, those eastern coasts are going to feel absolutely bitter through the uh, entire of Saturday. So starting off with a fairly widespread frost, particularly out towards the west, that's going to take a while to lift through the day because temperatures are never going to get really high, only around five or six degrees Celsius in places. And still, we continue with those showers over eastern parts of Scotland, then missing many of those eastern coasts, uh, but starting to make their way inland again over parts of uh, East Anglia. But you can see even down in the south, in the towns and cities, six or seven degrees Celsius only. That is dramatically colder than it has been. And again, in those eastern counties, very cold in the wind.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. A four-day ceasefire in Gaza has now started as the first group of hostages held by Hamas for nearly seven weeks prepare for their release. A group of 13 women and children will be freed at four o'clock today. It's expected a total number of 50 hostages will be freed by Hamas in return for 150 Palestinians during the ceasefire under a deal brokered by Qatar and the United States. Well, joining us is retired Air Vice Marshal and military analyst Sean Bell. Uh, good morning to you, Sean. I mean, this is a huge diplomatic breakthrough, but the setbacks, the delays that we've seen so far, this is extremely tentative, isn't it? Yeah, good morning, sir. Good morning, David. Uh, absolutely right. It's uh, incredibly precarious. I mean, it's taken a while to negotiate and then was delayed by uh, 24 hours. But as we as we stand at the moment, it does look as if uh, from two o'clock today, we may not get them exactly at that time. This parcel of 13 hostages, they may come in drips and drabs. They may come in a one slug. Four days, 12 or 13 a day, total of 50, with the potential for extending it. And it's worth pointing out as well that there's something like 200 trucks of aid that are also included uh, in this deal and an agreement not that the IDF will not do aerial patrols, reconnaissance patrols over the north of Gaza during the daylight, really, and over southern Gaza at all. But as you say, it's quite precarious. And we can get into that if you like. And just in terms of the ratio here, so obviously this is 50 Israelis in total for 150 Palestinians, a ratio of, say, three to one. I was saying over uh, the last few days on Talk TV about the number of Palestinians in prison, some 7,000. Now, clearly, what, what, can you, what can you interpret from this in terms of the situation on the ground? Hamas clearly wants to have a ceasefire. Netanyahu, very keen, this ceasefire is short, and he continues his military action. One of the uh, things that's quite interesting about this deal is that both sides, both Hamas and Israel, do are motivated by getting hostages released. Um, but that's about the limit of where they're aligned. As you say, the Israelis um, have kept reinforcing this is not the end of the war. The spokesman said literally only last night, you know, this is going to continue for at least a month or two more of the war. Um, they want to get on with it. They do not want to see any extension of the operational pause, whereas Hamas, this is a lifeline for them because every day that goes by where there's an operational pause, the more difficult it is for the Israelis to kickstart the war again, the more the international focus on the humanitarian situation uh, and, the, as I say, bluntly, the more difficult it is for Israelis to get their foot uh, back on the throat of Hamas. And what we are expecting is that at the end of the four-day uh, truce period, uh, there could be the potential for another 10 per day hostages to be released. Now, just imagine Israel would find that very, very difficult to resist. But of course, that means Hamas could go on for several days, potential weeks, with this extension of this uh, pause. And if, and it's a big if, but if they are able to end this conflict where they haven't been exterminated and they still have hostages, it'd be very difficult to see that uh, Hamas won't see that as some sort of victory. And when you look back at it, even now, there are over 13,000 um, Palestinian deaths that have happened. They believe there may be well over 2,000 bodies in the rubble as well, plus the devastation that's been wreaked in Gaza. There'll be huge questions as to what was this all about? Because um, it won't have been solved. Israel will not have achieved its objectives, yet there'll have been carnage wreaked across most of Gaza. Sean, we've been looking at the live uh, pictures this morning, uh, and you can see some smoke rising above buildings in Gaza City. It's not clear at the moment what has caused that. Uh, the Israeli military has also sounded, si sounded sirens in uh, villages near to the Gaza Strip, warning of possible Palestinian rocket attacks. And that's according to the Reuters news agency. No immediate confirmation that rocket attacks have indeed occurred. But if this ceasefire is breached, then what? Well, one of the questions was who's sort of supervising it. Mm. That, that, that's not entirely clear. It does appear that Qataris and the US might be supervising it. Um, and one of the challenges, bluntly, again, is that we we talk about Hamas and we talk about the Israelis, but um, there's always also other groups in um, Gaza, such as Islamic Jihad. They are not uh, aligned to Hamas. They have similar objectives. Um, and the, not all the hostages are held by one group. 
So if there are other groups or third parties, for example, the dark shadow of Iran has always um, weighed over this. If there are other actors who want to disrupt this process, it will not be difficult to do. The one thing that I think a lot of international uh, experts are hanging on to is the fact that because both sides are uh, pretty determined to release hostages, because it actually suits the agendas of both sides, uh, I suspect there will be ways that they'll find the way around should there be breaches of this ceasefire, which in some respects are inevitable. But I think all parties are keen to see that doesn't derail this hostage exchange process. And just in terms of the international community, the US obviously had a huge part to play in this, as did Qatar, the role of Egypt as well. Just in terms of how this moves forward, we were reading that Iran's foreign minister has met with Hezbollah as well. Just just what is your sense of, of the wider community in the Middle East and, and the way they want to see this play out? I mean, Biden talking very much again about a two-state solution, saying to Netanyahu, it is not possible for Israel to take control of, of Gaza. I think um, one of the tragedies of the uh, the seven weeks since the 7th of October is notwithstanding the atrocities that were committed by Hamas on that dreadful day, as a, as a former military guy, you look at these sorts of conflicts and realise that there is no military solution to finding a peace, a peace in the Middle East. There. It's not in, uh, between Israel and Hamas. And the tragedy is that the tripwire is going to go straight into military action, which is what we've seen for the last sort of seven weeks. Uh, and the devastation that's caused not only for the soldiers, but also for the civilians um, and also as now for the families of the hostages that have been released. So I think most parties realise there isn't a military solution and that once, well, as it inevitably will, the, the um, conflict actually pauses or at least comes to some sort of end, I think there'll be an added motivation to just try to find what is a workable solution, which does appear to be around a two-state solution, notwithstanding what some of the Israelis say. And I think there'll be huge diplomatic uh, international pressure because it's pretty clear that between Hamas and Israel, they won't be able to find uh, the, agree uh, the agreement that's required. Whereas pressure from America, from, the, from um, um, Saudi Arabia and potentially others, because there will be a huge rebuilding cost as well. And finding a way to uh, take away this anger, this tripwire approach that we've had over the last few years and get it back to putting humanity at the centre of this rather than polarised views. But unfortunately, I'm a pragmatist, grey haired, I've been around a few conflicts. I'm not hopeful that will be found anytime soon. Uh, Sean Bell, thank you very much indeed for bringing us your expertise this morning. It is 6.17. Now the fallout from the latest government figures on migration has left Westminster reeling. The recently sacked Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, has called the record high figure of 745,000 immigrants in the year to December 2022 a slap in the face to the British public who voted to control and reduce migration. Well, Conservative Member of Parliament and Talk TV host Jake Berry sat down with another former Home Secretary, Priti Patel, who believes the government has lost control of the issue. You introduced the points-based immigration system as per the manifesto that both you and I stood on. We've mm. seen new immigration figures this week. I mean, they're eye-wateringly large. How have we got to the point where the government seems to have lost control of immigration? So it's really important to differentiate between the legal system, mm. and rightly you've mentioned the points-based immigration system, and I do want to talk about this. And then you've got the illegal issue, which is obviously very contentious, but I don't think the government yeah. has handled that particularly well. On the points-based system, there are very, very clear parameters as to how people come to our country because on points-based system, they come here to work. Well, the full interview will be on after 12 o'clock, so don't miss that. But with us now is the former Downing Street Director of Communications, Jonathan Haslam. Uh, Jonathan, uh, this is very awkward for the Conservative Party, for the government, isn't it? Onto David Cameron, we had a party talking about reducing migration to the tens of thousands. Uh, Boris Johnson talked about a quarter of a million. That's a third of this revised figure. We're now at 745,000 in the last year. How does Rishi Sunak answer that? 
Well, good morning, Sarah. Morning, morning. David. Uh, well, I think the first thing he's got to do is not panic, uh, because we do need to look behind the figures to understand actually what's going on. And it'll be fascinating to see what uh, Pretty Patel says to Jake Berry. And the reason for that is, as you've identified immediately, we've got a points-based system. This was brought in, and the intention was you were going to be able to bring in people with higher qualifications. And there was a lot of argument at the time about what was the level, for example, with nurses, should that mm. cap, as it's called, you, the minimum level of pay be about 24,000 or whatever it is, 26,000 now. So we've been able to pick people from non-EU countries. So those numbers have gone up, and for the EU countries, they've gone down. And there are other exacerbating factors. And let's just think about who are these people coming in? They're people with skills. They are contributing to the economy. They're paying taxes. And that's a good thing, particularly for an ageing society. You know, we're not quite like Japan yet, but we are an ageing society. We need a lot of people to do a lot of things. So there's a huge amount to unpack. And I think it's important then we also say the two other factors. First of all, a lot of dependents come in. So if you're coming in mm. from, say, Australia and you're going to work in the health service, you want to bring your wife and your children, and you're going to be here for a couple of years, that's not unreasonable. The other thing is there's still a very, very big backlog of asylum claims going on, most of which will probably be agreed. That's about 130,000. Overall, the numbers are going to go down. I think that is very clear from what we see, because you've got Ukraine, where we have, as a, you know, a very good country, welcome people in from horrible circumstances. Hong and the other factor is well. Hong Kong yes. as well, Sarah, mm. as you rightly point out. It's complicated. Now, you, you know, if, you, if you're a reader of The Times, go and have a look at Matt Dathan's piece today, which unpacks all of that. But clearly it's a you know, rabid issue for parts but, of the sorry, right just, wing. Just it's different. In, in, in terms of the upcoming general election, this is yeah. a major problem, an Achilles heel for the Conservative Party, polling at 19%, Labour Party well ahead. Mm. Now, we've talked a great deal about illegal migration, haven't we? 44,000 yeah. that came in illegally last year. Here we are talking about huge numbers that have been left, let in through the front door whilst we've been watching the back door. Mm. And I think many Conservative voters will be absolutely livid about what's going on. You talked about the threshold there at 27,000. Um, Suella Braverman has said consistently and for a long time that salary level is far too low. Mm -hmm. It should be higher. I think you rightly mentioned dependence yes. as well. Yeah. Of course, we rely on immigration in this country. But to what extent? Isn't, isn't the bigger problem? The pace of change has been so fast. We don't have the schools. We don't have the hospitals to cope. Well, this is a problem for government overall. And I think it does identify one thing. Government isn't joined up, so you have silos going. And it is, you know, slightly disingenuous when you have Priti Patel and Suella Braverman that they were the Home Secretary, for heaven's sake, saying, you know, it's, it's a disaster. Well, it's your disaster. You should have put it right. You should be in a position of arguing in Cabinet to say, we need joined up policies, we need the schools, we need the infrastructure. And by the way, if you ask any voter, if you're looking at, say, an Australian doctor who's going to make you better, do you mind if that doctor is in here? No, because we aren't training enough Look doctors of our own. 157,000 vacancies uh, last year. But you're going to have this tussle, aren't you, within Cabinet? Mm. Because you're going to have the health department who need staff, the Home Office want to do something about it, and then Rishi Sunak's got to keep business happy yeah. as well. But, but, but isn't there one other problem here, mm. which is that if you've got 8 million people who are economically inactive in this country, yes. surely what we should be doing, and I speak as a doctor, mm. is training people to go into health and social care from this country? Of course they should, absolutely. Uh, but if you look at the health care service and look at the private uh, social care services as well, they will say, actually, these people aren't coming forward. They're, the 8 million inactive people, I mean, it is shocking. And for the mm. rest of us, we want to see more of what Jeremy Hunt was doing mm. there to say there is a carrot, which is we look after you, but there's also a stick. So, I mean, you've got to be responsible members of society here. But the plain fact is that when it comes to social care, most Brits don't seem to be interested. And somebody should tell Danny Kruger that because he should stop misleading people. And do you think the Conservatives can turn this around before the general election? It's a pretty hard thing to ask them to do, David. But uh, hope springs eternal. We've seen a 4% bounce because people do like the triple lock. And uh, at my age, I'm fully in favour of a triple <laughs> lock. But the important thing here is 
are people going to feel better? Mm. Mm. And are they going to feel better? And then there's that calculation. I think we rule out, you know, going to the end, you know, January next year, well, January 25, mm. just because it looks so desperate. And then the balance is between May and October. And uh, where's your I've money? Always, yeah, where's, where's your money? money? Good question. OK, OK, it's, it's a three pound note, but it's going <laughs> on. I'm going to May because if you get a real kicking in the local elections, and you still don't have a feel-good factor, and why would you? You know, whereas you can do a budget, you can say, drop stamp duty land tax, you can perhaps do something else on inheritance tax, mm. although it's a complete burn, that shimmer up, that is. That might give you a lift at the time. So you're saying time. early budget, early election? I would go along that line. But on you the other hand, here. I might rewrite history a bit later. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan has some great to hear from you. Thank you very much indeed. Still to come on Talk Today, more on Rishi Sunak's four-point boost. We were just discussing it there. And the Napoleon biopic hits the box office. Journalist Nikki Hodgson and deputy editor of Spike Fraser Myers are here to take us through this morning's papers. And remember, do get in touch, please, with all your views and opinions. And do stay with us. The time is 6.25. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> yeah. This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are Nothing you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.28. We'll have the papers in just a moment, but here is what else is coming up on today's programme. We're going to have the latest from Dublin after violence broke out in the city centre following a knife attack. That is in about 15 minutes. As Lewis Hamilton denies approaching Red Bull about a move to the team, Sam Ellard has the latest sport. That is just before 7 o'clock. 
And following the election of Hurt Wilders in the Netherlands and Argentina's Javier Milou, we'll ask, is a rise in right-wing leadership across the globe inevitable? We'll be discussing that just before nine. But first of all, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages. Now, The Telegraph says there's cabinet pressure on Rishi Sunak to slash migration as demand for a cap on foreign NHS workers' visas hit record highs. In The Express, a failure to half migration is a slap in the face for the public. That's according to former Home Secretary Suella Braverman. And The Mirror cries, make it stop, as they claim the Tory party is breaking Britain. Journalists Nikki Hodgson and Deputy Editor of Spiked Fraser Myers are with us for a look through this morning's papers. And we're going to kick off, uh, Fraser, with the mail. And uh, Suella Braverman is on the warpath again. Oh, it's very unlike her, very uncharacteristic. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she is uh, really against uh, the huge rise in migration. Well, it's actually, technically, it's fallen on last year. It peaked uh, in 2022, revised upwards by over 100,000. So that was about 745,000. Uh, net came to the UK uh, last year, um, around about six and a half, uh, 650,000 came this year. Which, uh, subject uh, to any so, further so, revisions. Yeah, well, so far. Subject to further know, revisions, yeah. yeah. And these are, big, these are big numbers. We're talking here about, um, you know, this year alone, the size of uh, Leeds, potentially, um, the amount of people coming over here. And um, so Suella is saying this is a slap in the face to voters, which is fair enough, considering that every single government, and actually, let's be fair, every single party, the Labour Party as well, Every election, they promise they're going to get migration down and it just goes up and up and up or is reaching record figures. So that's clearly um, an issue. Um, what can be done? I mean, what's interesting is that now we have this sort of points-based immigration system. So in theory, it should be much more responsive to the needs of the economy, filling uh, gaps in, uh, you know, labour shortages and things like that. So... Where do we where do we start cutting migration? I don't know. That's well, the that's the million dollar question. It's easy to say let's bring the numbers down. It's difficult to say which people we don't want. Well, yet. Nikki, I made this analogy earlier. The fact is we've been looking at the back door of this country, the 44,000 illegal migrants who've been coming here. The front door's been wide open. Anyone can come in. So when you're looking at those figures, you said they were high. They're enormously high. So you've, over two years, you've got a city the size of Birmingham coming in. Now, also, she makes a really good point, I think, about the threshold. If you say that the minimum threshold of, that you have to be paid in salaries is 23,000... 20, uh, 27,000, but the average salary in this country is 33,000. It's simply too low, isn't it? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't have the fear about immigration that lots of people do, actually. Um, I think it's... E even if you don't have the schools and the hospitals infrastructure? No, because, I mean, my problem is that I'm married to an immigrant. All my family are immigrants on my husband's side. My daughter is um, mixed Asian. And what I don't really like about the kind of rhetoric about this fear of being overwhelmed by immigration is the effect on our, my family, the effect on, you know, walking down the street and people feeling that you shouldn't be here or you're taking up space or you're taking up resources when, you know, you, you know my husband, for example, came here from Bangladesh, uh, set up a multi-million pound business, sold it, you know, he'd recruited hundreds of people. I think he's done a lot of good for society as an immigrant. So um, the kind of salary thing is kind of a moot point for me. I think the issue is a large number of the immigrants that have been here, you know, the numbers this year are from Hong Kong, they're from Ukraine because mm -hmm. of the war, and they're students. Now, I think that students, you know, students come here because we have world-class universities and they, foreign students prop up our universities because actually they our, yeah, because they pay and our home students wouldn't be able to afford to go actually if we had but isn't, fewer. isn't the issue that when you have all of these foreign students they're bringing dependents with them as well and that's where part of the problem arises also as as you know some of these foreign students then disappear they go off the radar and we don't know where they are after they've completed their degrees yeah but then again that's on the home office to chase them isn't it and to have a better track on them it isn't it isn't for us to say well you can't come in because we don't know what's going to happen to you afterwards i mean the thing is a lot of students are quite transient. Many of them do return to their home countries, some don't. And if they don't, well, they're contributing all their knowledge, uh, which they've studied for here, to our economy, you know? So uh, the biggest problem we have, you know, we don't have a shortage of houses because we have too many immigrants. We have a shortage of houses because the Tories haven't built enough. You know? That's very true. So, you know, so all the problems that we're talking about, the NHS is in dis you know, disrepair because of lots of different systemic problems but, over but many years. But isn't it because it's the pace of change? I agree with you totally. Immigration is the lifeblood of this country. We've relied on immigration for, for centuries. Mm. It's the pace of change. And that's what I think people are not happy about.
Yeah, and I, I think, you know, and because, yeah, it's public services and house building are not uh, keeping pace with that change, and that, that is a problem. You know, in a different context where Britain was a really dynamic, growing economy, then I really don't think this would be anything to worry about. It essentially would be a very exciting thing to have all these people joining us um, in, a, in, a, in a growing economy. But we're not. We're stagnating. And so I think that is why people have a feel that um, resources are being, you know, fought out for, in a mm -hmm. sense. Do you know what I mean? It's, it, it, we're not growing the pie in the way that we should. And that makes the um, people feel worse about immigration than they might or otherwise. Mm. I imagine people are spluttering over their cornflakes uh, reading all of those front pages. <laughs> Should we move on to the Times? This is really interesting about the autumn statement. Mm -hmm. Jeremy Hunt, uh, Nikki, were very, very excited about... Actually made, uh, I thought, quite a nice little joke at the beginning of his autumn statement. I mean, clearly there, there is some uplift in that. This is the, the headline, the benefit rise, a surprise vote winner. The Tories have gone up four points on the back of the autumn statement. This is what they've yeah. been waiting for, isn't it? <laughs> they wanted is. an electoral bounce. This is exactly what they needed, but actually this is probably as good as it's going to get for them <laughs> unless something really significant happens news-wise in the next uh, well, four, four months I would say yeah so I mean they they are actually surprised that 64% of voters said they were fine with the benefit rise um, and you know that's considered weird because I don't know the rhetoric is that too many people are on benefits and taking too much money so I'm, I'm glad that actually voters are saying oh well, we can see we can see why people should have more money on benefits it should be in rise with inflation so, I mean, that's got, that's, I mean, I feel better about the country for hearing that statistic, I'll be honest. But there were other things as well in this. Uh, most people overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly supported the um, raising the minimum wage to £11.44. Mm -hmm. That was backed by 85% of the public, which I think is really significant. But opinion was split on whether the tax cuts were affordable and 31% um, saying they were not. So, although people kind of favour the individual elements, they don't think they'll be better off overall. And that's got to be the pinch point for the Tories, and, isn't it? And we've had think tanks like the Resolution Foundation saying actually we're going to be £1,900 yeah. worse off yeah. mm. uh, by the end yeah. of this parliament. I mean, it is a four-point uh, boost for the Conservatives, but from a pretty low base. Yeah, they're still 19 it? points behind. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they've got a, an extraordinarily steep hill to climb over Absolutely. the coming months. And the other question being asked in the papers is when? <laughs> is this? <laughs> Are they going yeah. to call a snap? election? I th I th well, it's, it's hard to tell, isn't it? Because, you know, there's not, obviously they're so far behind now, mm. but you don't get any sense from Rishi Sunak or Jeremy Hunt that they have some kind of plan to turn things around. Now, there is still, between now, possibly, if they had an election in May or, or later on next year, there's another budget. So are there, is there a potential for more tax giveaways, more rises in public spending that might... Um, you know, that might turn on voters, I, I don't know. But I still just can't see that that would turn things around because people are thinking about... People are not just going to be thinking about their current financial situation. They're going to be looking back over the past five years, 13 years. Um, I mean, you know, it's not necessarily the Tories' fault even, but, you know, going right back to the financial crisis, productivity in this country is flatlined, wages are flatlined. We've been through the longest period of um, stagnant wages since the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. So are people going to look at a cut in national insurance and think, thank you, Jeremy Hunt, you know, I'm going to go... Well, out. No, I think you make a, a really good point. Also, in COVID, of course, they locked everyone down. People mm. have decided they don't want to go to work five days a week. And so, in many ways, some of this was the government's doing. I do think this is a, a sleight of hand by the Chancellor because he says, OK, I've got £15 billion pounds of headroom... But what we are not talking about is the fiscal drag. Because those tax thresholds have been frozen, he's actually pulling in so much more money, 12.5 billion this year, another 27 billion next year. So you may feel slightly better off, but actually you're worse off. Well, and also the point that energy bills are going to scupper most people anyway. They're going to go up so much that these uh, apparent savings are negligible. And they're built in, you know, the, the savings, so to speak, or the, the headroom yeah. is created by the assumption that there will be massive cuts to public services. Probably Labour will have to do them or something like that. I mean, it's, the headroom thing is made up. Yes, like, it's just, uh, it's that just was what Paul Johnson of the yeah. IFS said, it, wasn't it? The it's, numbers it's a, in this autumn statement yeah. were sort of made up. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's it a trick on a spreadsheet. But, I mean, yeah. Um, shall we have a look at the Telegraph? Because the other big story today, of course, is the ceasefire coming into effect. Uh, in the Israel-Gaza war. So, um, Israel and Hamas have brokered a deal um, via Qatar, 
where we're going to see some of the first um, hostages, hostages released. We're expecting um, 50 on the Israeli side and possibly 150 uh, Palestinian prisoners released uh, in return. And they've done a deal where essentially the ceasefire will be extended for every certain amount of Israeli hostages uh, are released. So this is, this is good news. People want to see these people uh, turn home. I, I think, you know, some people who were at the peace marches are trying to say that this is what we wanted. I think that's a bit disingenuous because they weren't calling for the return of hostages. Uh, they were calling for Israel to stop unilaterally. But there you go. Well, well, I think that's right. And also, as you rightly say, for every 10 hostages released, there'll be another day of ceasefire. I mean, clearly what I think Hamas is looking for is more than the four-day ceasefire because I think what this shows is the dire situation that Hamas is now in. And, of course, Israel absolutely desperate to get their hostages is back quite rightly and this is a three to one swap so for every 50 Israelis there'll be 150 Palestinians released from prison mm. and I think you know given the extent of what's happened now in Gaza you know with hospitals being bombed hospitals mm. being used or occupied there isn't really anywhere else to go is there if you know what I mean in terms of what could happen next from from Hamas and um, I am sure they will be absolutely flailing and be desperate to regroup yeah, and, and a ceasefire does give them that uh, vital time. It also gives time to get aid mm. in, more aid trucks uh, standing by waiting and the hostages out. But the 50 uh, this week, and it is, as we were discussing earlier on the programme, a precarious uh, ceasefire. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. just imagine, we're going to be speaking to a relative of uh, some of the hostages later on in the programme. Just imagine the agonising wait for those families every day this week and beyond. And and there are discussions that it won't necessarily be whole families that are returned, so you can have one person, one member of one family released and another kept in captivity. There are people, you know, there are children in captivity at the moment uh, in Gaza who don't know that the rest of their family were killed oh, in yeah. the October 7th uh, attack. So, yeah, it's, you know, grim times. It, it is indeed. Um, a real humanitarian catastrophe, actually, mm. I think, on both sides, actually. Nikki and Fraser, that's all we've got time for with the papers uh, for this hour, but they will be back in the next hour with plenty more. Now let's get a quick news update with Emily. Good morning. A four-day pause in fighting in Gaza has started ahead of the release of Israeli and Palestinian hostages later. Explosions were heard in the hours leading up to the scheduled start of the agreement, which was struck between Israel and Hamas. This afternoon, the terror group is expected to free the first 13 Israeli captives. Former Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell says it's a precarious but hopeful time. This parcel of 13 hostages, they may come in drips and drabs, they may come in a one slug. Four days, 12 or 13 a day, total of 50, with the potential for extending it. And it's worth pointing out as well that there's something like 200 trucks of aid that are also included uh, in this deal. The police chief in Dublin has blamed lunatics and hooligans that are driven by the far right for widespread unrest and violent scenes in the city centre. Several vehicles, including a police car, were set alight during clashes with officers yesterday evening, which was sparked following the stabbing of a woman and three children earlier in the afternoon. A five-year-old girl remains in emergency care this morning after the attack. And former Olympian Oscar Pistorius will attend a parole hearing later to try to secure early release from a South African prison. The double amputee is serving 13 years for murder. The sprinter shot his girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, at his home 10 years ago through a toilet door. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines at 7 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, Emily Rose. Uh, right, Joe. dare we ask, what is the weather like? It's turning colder. But how cold, I hear you ask. Well, over the last few days, we've seen kind of 12, 13 degrees Celsius through the day. Uh, tomorrow, it's going to be closer to five or six. And with the wind chill, that's going to feel close to freezing. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. So what exactly is changing? Well, we're seeing the air coming from the north. It's an Arctic flow. And alongside that, we've got those uh, isobars bunched together, which are going to give some very strong winds along eastern coasts. And that's where it's going to feel really bitterly, perishingly cold, certainly uh, through tomorrow. So that's going to be the really cold day. By the time we get to Sunday, we've got another area of low pressure coiling across us, and that's going to bring milder conditions for a while. And then next week, we're back into unsettled uh, conditions. But certainly starting off this morning, we have some snow showers over Scotland, a few 
rain showers along eastern coasts and into parts of East Anglia. For Wales and the Midlands, it's a largely grey start. There's a lot of cloud around and some drizzly bits and pieces. Now, those will gradually die out during the day. We will see the sunshine extending from the north, but uh, temperatures over Scotland, really not very high, only around four or five degrees Celsius. Very strong winds over Shetland and, as I say, along those eastern coasts. Soon as night arrives, well, those temperatures are going to plummet. And by this stage, we'll have mostly clear skies out towards the west, so a widespread frost. Eastern coast will be a little bit milder, partly because of the cloud and the showers, but also that wind will help keep temperatures up. But it's going to be a cold, cold night elsewhere. We could be looking at around minus 6, minus 7 degrees Celsius in some parts. And obviously that frost taking a while to lift first thing on Saturday morning. But as it does lift, we should see some lovely sunshine. Again, it's going to be those eastern coasts that want to feel very cold and we'll be most likely to see a few showers. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Now, violent clashes have taken place in Dublin overnight after a knife attack injured five people, including three children. A five-year-old girl is in a critical condition in hospital after the stabbing outside a primary school. Police have blamed the unrest on a lunatic hooligan faction driven by far-right ideology. Joining us now from Dublin is reporter Elizabeth Hurst. Uh, Elizabeth, significant tensions there overnight. What is the latest? So there's a significant guard of presence here in Dublin this morning. The Dublin city is just waking up, but last night it was described as absolute chaos. So what we know so far, an attack took place yesterday afternoon around 1.30 outside a school just behind me on Parnell Street East. This part of the city is quite busy. There was lots of people around. Um, around 1.30 p.m. there was children queuing up outside the school behind me. And a man who is in his 40s um, then attacked three young children and a woman who we believe is a crash worker um, as well. She was, she was stabbed and she was trying to come to the aid of the children. Now we know she's in quite a serious condition in hospital along with a five-year-old little girl who was also in critical condition. Um, another girl who's aged five and a boy aged six were also taken to hospital while the boy has since been discharged. We know that the girl who is five is remaining in a critical condition this morning. Um, now, Tensions did boil over last night. There was uh, arguably a, quite a large presence of people on the streets, which has been described, as you mentioned, as absolute chaos and thuggery. So Gardaí said they are following a definitive line of inquiry. Uh, the man was injured in the attack. He is currently in hospital receiving treatment. Um, so about 7 o'clock last night, there was about 100 to 200 protesters here on the streets. They had a clash with Gardaí, who are the Irish police. There was fireworks being thrown, a, a lot of unrest on the streets and, and looting followed in a number of shops. A Lewis, which is a light tram, which travels through the city, was burnt out along with a car uh, and, and buses as well. So there's been a lot of criminal damage and uh, it, it was just, just a shocking night of events in, in Dublin city, really. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed, Elizabeth. Still to come on Talk Today, Sam Ellard. Well, he's got your sport. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Uh, Lewis Hamilton, big news in F1. Dismiss rumours he uh, could leave Mercedes. Plus, we'll be talking about Man City and Liverpool. They've written to their fans ahead of this weekend's Premier League clash. And find out why Moni Novak Djokovic lost his call once again with fans. This is after his Davis Cup win. This is Talk Today. A very good morning. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to use the XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do I'm you're, going going to, to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.50. Now in sport, Lewis Hamilton has denied claims he's been approached by the Red Bull boss to mobilise a move away from Mercedes. It follows rumours fuelled by a text he received from the Christian Horner congratulating the seven-time Formula One world champion on his performance earlier in the season. Talk Sports' Sam Ellard joins us now to tell us more. Uh, Sam, Hamilton then accusing Red Bull of kind of... Dropping his name out in Stirring conversation. Stirring things up, I think. Stirring things <laughs> up, yeah. Is a phrase. Yeah, um, so Lewis Hamilton recently signed a new contract with Mercedes in August. And Christian Horner, who runs Red Bull, so the two rival teams, Hamilton's and Mercedes, Horner, Red Bull, we gave an interview with the Daily Mail where he said, or claims, that just before Hamilton has signed that new contract with Mercedes, that there was conversations between Horner and Excuse a member me. of, bless you, and a member, yeah. of, uh, and a member of Lewis Hamilton's team. Right. Lewis Hamilton very much denied that. Now, there have been some reports that Lewis Hamilton's dad engaged in a conversation with Christian Horner, but nothing formal, not inquiring about the possibility of Hamilton leaving Mercedes and going to Red Bull. So Lewis Hamilton very much denies this. And, of course, Lewis Hamilton, in August, did end up signing a new two-year contract with Mercedes. It would have been very controversial to go Mercedes to Red yes. Bull. And Hamilton wanted the challenge of trying to get Mercedes back to the top. He won four consecutive F1 championships only a few years ago. But the last two years, it has been won by Red Bull and Max Verstappen. They've been the dominant team. But Lewis Hamilton says... Uh, um, stirring things up, I think he's accused Christian Horner of doing. Right. I, I just wonder what the motivation here was. He's driven for Mercedes, what, since 2013 yep. or thereabouts? Yep. Yep. So, yep. Yep. as you say, it would seem very odd then to move, wouldn't it, to yeah. your rival? I mean, the only reason why he might want to do that is they haven't had great success over the past couple of years. There have been maybe some, some disagreements on the track. But Lewis Hamilton was very quick to come out and give an interview ahead of the racing this weekend in Dubai where he wanted to make it perfectly clear. Mercedes is his team. He signed a new contract and he yep. doesn't want to jump ship to join the best team and carry on winning a Red Bull. He wants Mercedes and he wants to ultimately be winning F1 championships with Mercedes. And how special would it be if Lewis Hamilton has, has one, more, one more season in him? That would be quite incredible. Uh, now, Man City and Liverpool have written to football fans appealing uh, to them to, to keep things calm this weekend, not yeah. throwing missiles. I mean, the fact you have, you have to ask. Yeah, but I mean, it shouldn't come as a surprise. Unfortunately, no. football fans, uh, not all, but some football fans, when they go to football matches, don't know how to behave properly. Uh, we have seen missiles being thrown in the past. We've also seen 
um, tragedy chanting between between sets of supporters uh, in this fixture, which is obviously absolutely despicable and disgusting. Chanting about and all you can do chanting about Hillsborough and, and other stuff, yeah, which is completely unacceptable. Um, you hope and, and have everything crossed that this doesn't, mm. no incidents happen, because really, Man City Liverpool is the fixture right now in English football. It's been it's been the game for the past four or five seasons. Apart from last season, where Liverpool were way beyond, uh, way off the pace. They've been the two best teams in the country. Mm. Man City have been the best, but Liverpool have been the team that really pushed them. And come 2.30 on Saturday, when this game is finished, we don't want to be speaking about an incident outside of the ground. We don't want to be speaking about VAR. We want to speak about what's happened on the pitch, because it's first versus second. There's one point separating these two teams. We've yeah. got the two best managers in the country. We've got the best players in the country. We want to be speaking on Monday morning and over the weekend about a great game of football, not idiots that misbehave. should say as well, this game was supposed to be a half-five kickoff tomorrow. Yeah, yeah um, so it has, has, been, has been changed to 12.30 yeah. um, because it gives people less time to, to drink Hit and then the behave in a in a bad, bad so, fashion. So you yeah. mentioned VAR. This is a brilliant story, isn't it? About this Br is British Airways yes. pilots helping referees. Somebody said to me this morning, have you seen uh, this story about BA and VAR? I said, uh, you, have you got this wrong? Have you made a mistake? But no, it's on the on the back of the Times this morning. Um, Henry Winter and Martin Ziegler said this morning the Premier League referees are being helped by British Airways pilots to hone the art of communicating under pressure. Uh, the two pilots gave a presentation to the select group of officials uh, on the need for clarity and accuracy to use minimum Picking syllables. Picking your words very carefully. Absolutely, because there was a, real, uh, a bad incident at Spurs Liverpool a few weeks ago where, to cut a long story short, a goal should have been given for offside, right? Originally given offside. The communication was supposed to be, no, it's onside goal. Yeah. There was a bad communication and offside stood. And it was factually wrong. They messed up. So the pilots, who are used to dealing, obviously, clearly, under pressure, they need clarity. Mm -hmm. They don't need too much in the air. They need short, sharp instructions. They've been speaking with Premier League officials to try and help them with that. BA, if you're listening, <laughs> please sort these guys out. <laughs> they are all over the place. They're ruining they football. Are. Save Premier League football. Who would have thought BA pilots would no. save VAR I'm and help these officials? I'm going to give you one very short, sharp instruction quickly. Novak Djokovic, yeah. angry with British fans. He's always angry now, though, isn't he? <laughs> angry man. As, as, as he's he getting older, angry, he's yeah. moaning, he's miserable, he's having a moan at everyone. Uh, he beat Cameron Norrie, who's representing uh, Team GP in the Davis Cup. Um, he was giving it some of that. He was shushing the crowd. Uh, he gave a little uh, interview after the game and some of the Team GB fans, they were playing the drums, Banging they the were drum. making a lot of noise. Not he right wasn't thing. happy, says the lack of disrespect. And I'm... Oh, now you're just getting to Novak, isn't it? <laughs> Liven up, Novak. Goodness me, any danger? No disrespect to you. We could talk to you for hours, at uh, Sam, but Always. we are going to have to I feel to disrespected. Go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed, lots more still to come here on Talk Today, ahead of the release of more than a dozen women and children head hostage by Hamas for nearly two months. We'll be speaking to an Israeli hostage negotiator. And do keep your thoughts and opinions coming in, please. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with David Bull and Sarah Hewson. A very good morning. It is 7 o'clock on Friday the 24th of November. You're with Talk Today on TV, on radio, online and of course on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Families on tenterhooks. A four-day truce has started in Gaza with the first to mass hostages and prisoners of Israel set to be freed this afternoon. Suella sticks her oar in. The former Home Secretary calls on the government to act now after record net migration figures, with pressure also piling on the Prime Minister from within his own cabinet. And riots in Dublin. Violence breaks out following an attack that left a five-year-old girl seriously injured. A taste of winter as cold air spreads across the country. All the details coming up shortly. Sounds absolutely delightful, Joe. Thank you very much indeed. If you are just waking up, we talked there in the headlines about migration. The papers are full of it. The front page of the Times, migration figures pile pressure on the Prime Minister. Cabinet pressure on Sunak to slash migration. I mean, if you look at the Daily Mail as well, Suella leads Tory revolt. She's taken to Twitter or X and she is really laying in to the government. She says in two years we now have another population the size of Birmingham. She said that we had a pledge to reduce net migration to 229,000 or thereabouts under David Cameron. That's what was pledged. The government has woefully missed that pledge. Yeah, lots of you have been getting in touch with us on that subject. Ron has said the government was never in control of immigration. That includes Priti Patel, Suella Braverman and Rishi Sunak. Uh, and Paul says this woman's opinion does not matter. She was Home Secretary, so why did she not sort this out then? The biggest problem in this country is our politicians. They're seemingly incapable of doing anything. And of course we've been also been talking this morning about so the Conservatives fresh on the autumn statement have gone up two points in the polls but of course this will make very salutary reading for the Prime Minister. We're also talking about whether the budget will be earlier. Will they go for a May general election? Let us know all of your thoughts please. You can email us talktoday at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talktv and text the word talk and your message to 8722. Whilst you do that it's now time for your headlines with Emily. Good morning. A four-day pause in fighting in Gaza and the process to release Israeli and Palestinian hostages has now begun. The temporary ceasefire is the first in almost seven weeks of fighting and later we should see the first 13 hostages being released by Hamas. In a meeting with the new foreign secretary, the Israeli prime minister said he's hopeful the planned release will go ahead. Uh, we hope to get uh, our hostages out. Uh, it's uh, not without its uh, challenges. But we have to. We hope to get this first uh, tranche out, and then we're committed to getting everyone out. But we'll continue with our war aims, uh, namely to uh, uh, eradicate Hamas. 
Dublin's police chief has blamed lunatics and hooligans who are driven by the far right for rioting in the city centre last night. Buses and trams were set on fire after a woman and three children were stabbed outside a primary school. The Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, has drawn up plans to cut the number of people coming to live and work in the UK. They include a cap on the number of overseas care workers. Official figures published yesterday show that net migration reached a record high of almost three quarters of a, mil of a million last year. Well, former Downing Street Communications Director Jonathan Haslam's told Talk Today it's a major issue for the Tories. It is you know, slightly disingenuous when you have Priti Patel and Suella Braverman that they were the Home Secretary, for heaven's sake, saying, you know, it's, it's a disaster. Well, it's your disaster. You should have put it right. You should be in a position of arguing in Cabinet to say, we need joined up policies, we need the schools, we need the infrastructure. And the Brit Awards is expanding the number of nominees from 5 to 10 to address criticism over diversity. There was backlash against the show in January when it was revealed that no women were shortlisted for the Best Artist Prize. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. Are you a fan of the Brits? Yes, I love them. And I'm very interested by these changes because R&B and pop used to be one category and from next year it's going to be separate because a lot of R&B artists weren't able to compete with artists like Dua Lipa or Harry Styles, so it's nice now there'll be a separate category. Yeah. I'm not sure what it means, though, to increase the number of nominees in order to improve diversity. Are you saying that if you've only got five, then you're not going to have enough diversity in, in those? Well, that's a, it's a really good point, actually, because surely diversity should go through this if you have exactly. five. They should be diverse in their entirety. I mean, I think the Brits is brilliant celebration of the greatest talent and, and anything that can be done to increase representation has to be a good thing, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much, Emily. Let's get the weather now uh, with Jo. And Jo, how is it looking? <laughs> a little chilly. It is looking chilly. It's going to be an awful lot colder, but just because it's colder doesn't mean to say it won't be brighter for some. Uh, but of course, there will be some wintry showers for others and an extreme wind chill in the east. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. So temperatures this morning are ranging from freezing in the north to around 12 degrees Celsius down in the southwest. And that's the highest temperature we're likely to see. They're just going to fall throughout the day. And that's as this cold air floods in from the Arctic. It's going to bring some showers with it, particularly to eastern coasts. Tomorrow's going to be cold too. And then we see milder conditions on Sunday as a cloud and rain spread across the country. And in fact, then we return to fairly unsettled conditions for next week. But certainly for today, it's a little bit grim across uh, central areas parts of Wales, a lot of cloud and uh, light patchy rain. That's going to be clearing away southwestwards through the day. We've already got wintry showers over parts of Scotland and those showers are also going to affect eastern coasts. Now the wind direction is critical here, a little bit more northerly or northeasterly and these eastern coasts will see greater numbers of showers but certainly for today we'll see a few along those eastern coasts and down into East Anglia as well. Temperatures in single figures for most uh, and it will be very windy as I say in those eastern areas so a wind chill there. And then as we go into this evening and overnight, really very little change. Apart from the fact under the clear skies of the west, we will see uh, a very widespread and quite severe frost. Temperatures could fall back to around minus 5, minus 6 degrees Celsius. And still those showers continue. The winds will ease a little bit, but uh, they'll stay uh, enough so that they'll actually prevent a frost for those eastern areas. So a very cold start to Saturday then. That frost very slow to clear, but as it does, there'll be plenty of sunshine around it will actually be a very lovely day but uh, temperatures will struggle to get to around five or six degrees celsius which in those western areas won't be too bad but where you still got a uh, breeze we've got a wind chill which will make it feel like freezing over parts of scotland around one degree along those eastern coasts and possibly about three or four degrees celsius for parts of east anglia those single digit values are for the towns and the cities it will feel cooler still in some rural areas later on the sunshine becomes hazy as cloud starts to increase from the west Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Thanks very much indeed, Joe. Our top story today, a temporary truce in Gaza is officially underway as of 5 a.m. this morning in a deal made between the Israeli government and Hamas. The four-day ceasefire will see 50 Israelis returned with the first 13 women and children freed at about 2 o'clock this afternoon with as many as 150 Palestinian prisoners to be released in exchange. Now, these are live pictures from the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egypt, where the first trucks carrying desperately needed aid have been seen crossing into the enclave. 200 aid trucks will be entering uh, Gaza every day. Now, Gershon Baskin, a hostage negotiator and advisor on the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, joins us now uh, from Jerusalem. Gershon, it's, it's taken seven weeks to get here. Tell us uh, how significant this moment is that the ceasefire is now underway. It's quite significant. The, the two major aims of this war for the Israelis is to return all the Israeli hostages and to, of course, eradicate Hamas's ability to govern the territory called the Gaza Strip and continue to threaten Israel. This is the first step toward uh, the achievement of those goals with the return of the first 50 hostages with an open-ended possibility of including more hostages on day five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten until all the civilian hostages are returned. It's the first day that Israelis can smile a little bit since October 7th. And, and how fragile is this? Just before the ceasefire came into effect this morning, there were sounds of, of rocket fire, of mortar fire this morning. I mean, we, we talked earlier as well about this three for one, so 50 Israelis for 150 Palestinians, 7,000 Palestinians held in prisons. Hamas clearly wants this ceasefire to continue. I understand the deal on the table is for every 10 Israelis that are released, there'll be one more day of a ceasefire. But th these are very fragile times, aren't they? They certainly are. Um, just a, a single gunman on either side could break the ceasefire and lead to an explosion that would stop the deal. But both sides, as you mentioned, are interested in this deal taking place. There isn't really an alternative way to get the hostages home and to enable both warring parties to have a break, to have a breather. They've been at it for seven weeks in the field, fighting each other. Of course, in Gaza, they've been bombarded heavily by the Israeli Air Force, but ground troops are also struggling in the daily attempt to each side survive and win their victory. It's a literally bloody a bloodbath down there. And um, uh, a break is good for everyone. I don't believe that this is a long-term truce or the end of the war. Israel will not rest until Hamas is no longer able to govern that territory. So it, it will pick up after uh, the uh, opportunities for bringing back hostages is e exhausted or exhausted, and then the war will resume. Um, I think that Hamas will be left with tens of Israeli soldiers as hostages. Negotiations will begin uh, on the release of what Hamas is demanding, the 7,200 Palestinian prisoners in Israel. That's very unlikely to happen. I can't foresee any Israeli government accepting to release more than 600 people who are sitting on life sentences for killing Israelis being released in this deal. So we're probably going to see military operations going in search and rescue of hostages after the war resumes. Sean, can I talk to you about the logistics of today? Uh, 4 p.m. local time, 2 p.m. at UK time. We are expecting to see the first group of hostages being released. How does that process unfold? Well, there's a six hour Israeli ceasing of flying drones over Gaza. During that time, Hamas will organize and locate the hostages that are being released today. I am assuming from Hamas's previous behavior that we will see three, four, five, six convoys of identical vehicles leaving from different locations in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, heading to the Rafah crossing to Egypt. At the crossing, there will be a, a international Red Cross personnel who will check the hostages, their identity, see if they need medical care. They'll be uh, transferred to the Egyptian side. The Egyptian intelligence is organizing there. Additional or the same international Red Cross personnel will cross with them to the Egyptian side. 
and then they'll be turned over to the Israeli side of the border, where I assume there'll be ambulances and helicopters ready to take the hostages. They will be taken probably to an Israeli military base, and then those who need medical care. I believe that they'll all be taken to a hospital. There's a children's hospital in, in, in Israel where they'll all be taken, and, and that's where they'll meet their families. At the same time, the International Red Cross will be checking the uh, host, the is uh, Palestinian prisoners that are being released today. They are all being gathered from two or three prisons into one prison near Ramallah. From there, they will be released to the Red Cross, who will check their identity, and then they will cross the checkpoint at Betunia, which is near Ramallah, into the West Bank. And, ju and just in terms of that, you made an interesting comment saying this isn't the end of the war as far as Israel is concerned. The director of Al Shifa Hospital arrested Israel, uh, insistent that underneath that hospital is the command and control center for Hamas. They've released pictures as well. Israel wants to press on, doesn't it, into the south southern part of Gaza? There's no scenario that I can see where Hamas is in control of Gaza at the end of this war. Um, Israel's intention is to dismantle their infrastructure, to find the political and military leaders of Hamas and to kill them all, to ensure that uh, Hamas will not have the ability to continue to control the territory. Of course, if Israel decides to stay in the Gaza Strip after the war is over, whenever that will be, we will see Palestinian insurgency against Israel. That is why the um, it is impossible to defeat the ideology and the idea of Hamas with with the military, there was have to be a political pr plan supported by the international community and forced on Israel to recognize the state of Palestine. Isn't it about time that your own government, the UK, uh, recognize the state of Palestine? They've been talking about a two-state solution for 30 years. It's about time to recognize the second state and give Palestinians hope and a reason to live for Palestine and not just die for Palestine. These are the kind of things that need to happen immediately when the war is over. The Palestinian people need to take charge. They need to have reforms and hold elections to, to elect a leadership that represents them. The territory of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip need to be re reunified as one single political uh, state entity. Uh, and we need to move on with the peace process, with negotiations that have to be imposed on Israel and the Palestinians. And, and I, I think the international community, uh, there is strong resolve to have a two-state solution. And clearly the current situation cannot be allowed to continue. Thank you so much for joining us. That's Gershon Baskin there. The time is 7.15. Now, Downing Street is facing huge backlash after yesterday's net migration figures were released. The former Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, called the record high figure of 745,000 immigrants last year a slap in the face to the British public who voted to control and reduce migration. And number 10 has itself commented that the figure is far too high. Well, joining us is the former Conservative Member of Parliament and Minister Sir Gerald Howarth. Uh, Sir Gerald, very good to talk to you. Uh, the Conservative Party, quite frankly, has lost control of migration in this country. I think uh, many backbenchers are saying it's game over. They're deeply angry about what has happened on the Conservatives' watch. Well, good morning to you both from uh, a lovely dawn here in Suffolk. Uh, yes, I think it is uh, unquestionably the case that the government has lost control. And the irony is that in 2016, the British people voted uh, to uh, regain control over their borders. So the government has control over our borders, but they have let in people with 400,000 student visas, 322,000 uh, work visas last year. It's, uh, it's simply unsustainable, the effect on our infrastructure, on our public services, as well as social cohesion. This is absolutely massive. It's a question of numbers and the government has not got control. And I'm afraid to say, despite these people all being friends of mine, I've heard this rhetoric time and time and time again. David Cameron, who led the government of which I was a member, uh, promised that we would reduce the number of migrants to uh, double to tens of thousands uh, by the end of the first uh, parliament by 2015. That didn't happen and it has got worse. Ministers have got to get a grip because the British people are absolutely fed up. 1977, Margaret Thatcher said we were being swamped and look what has happened since. We've had two former Home Secretaries uh, talking about this in the last 24 hours. Uh, Sterling House, Priti Patel, uh, has said the government's lost control. Uh, Suella Bravman has said it's a slap in the face. Is it a bit rich for these two to be complaining about it when it was their job to tackle it? 
Well, I certainly uh, was in close touch with Priti Patel when she was Home Secretary, and I know that she worked her socks off on this. And indeed, she was the architect of the Rwanda policy, uh, which was thwarted by the uh, uh, legal people, many of them, of course, uh, acting on behalf of uh, migrants in this country, or organisations representing uh, migrants, therefore not representing uh, the British people. She worked incredibly hard, but uh, you may have seen an interesting article in the Daily Telegraph about a week ago, uh, written by an anonymous civil servant in the Home Office, making clear that Home Office officials deeply resent uh, the policy of trying to curtail migration into this country. We are faced with a civil service, particularly in that department, it would appear if the, that report is accurate, who are actively working against the policy of the elected British government, elected by the people, elected to put into place control over migration how this country is made up and public officials paid by us are failing to implement the policy. That is absolutely outrageous, unacceptable, and a very profound threat to our democracy if we cannot rely on an impartial civil service. And just to remind you, there was a picture of a lady, a director of the Home Office, uh, during lockdown on a Zoom call, who was sporting a Black Lives Matter badge, and she had a poster in support of the striking miners in 1972 in other words, wearing upon her, her sleeve openly her political allegiance. And that is unacceptable. I, I thought the whole point of the civil service was to be impartial. I think you're absolutely right. Certainly, just in terms of, of uh, the civil service, they want cheap labour, don't they? This is the point that's been made by Suella Braverman. She said the threshold is far too low, 26,000, when you've actually got a median salary in this country of 33,000. That has to be raised. Also, if we have 8 million people who are economically inactive in this country, we need to train our own people. Stop relying on cheap labour from abroad also, just in terms of this, I think the sense from the country is that whilst people generally welcome immigration, it has to be controlled. It's far too fast, and they are seeing this country change in ways they can't even imagine. Well, you're absolutely right, David. The country is being changed, and we have seen on our streets massive uh, demonstrations in support of, uh, essentially, in support of Muslims in Gaza completely uh, oblivious, uh, certainly that is the perception, completely oblivious of the cause of this tragedy, namely the utterly unforgivable, brutal murder of innocent women and children in, uh, in Israel. And we are finding, for example, we have Islamist threats to our country. My great friend Sir David Amos was murdered in cold blood um, by a Muslim terrorist uh, in his constituency. We saw the Ari Ariana Grande concert in Manchester in 2017, where 22 people, 22 innocent people were murdered going to a, a, a pop concert. We saw in 2015 at King's Cross, the 7-7 bombing, where 56 people lost their lives and over 750 people were injured by uh, Islamist suicide bombers. This is what is happening to our country, and it would have happened more frequently had it not been for the amazing efforts of our security services, not just the police, but particularly our intelligence services, in thwarting many more attacks. Our country is being changed before our eyes. We no longer, I can no longer refer to my Christian name. I have to put my first name. Where I write it to, where I'm doing a form on which I have to write it out, I cross out first and I put Christian. And why do we do that? Because somebody might be offended. Well, I'm offended, but it appears to be the case that normal, ordinary British people, the vast majority of this country, can be offended as much as you like, but you offend a minority in the can most tiniest way, and you get in trouble. Can I just get back to the figures, though, that we're talking about yeah. uh, today, Sir Gerald? Because the majority of people coming into this country are coming here either to study or to work. They're coming here on work visas, they're sponsored by businesses, they're coming to work in the NHS because we have a need for those people to play a role in our society. We have huge gaps in the workforce, more than 150,000 vacancies in the care sector. What are you saying? Where, where do we cut those numbers from? Well, I'm saying exactly what David said, which is that we should be training our own people. And but despite our own people the fact aren't that coming forward for those jobs, are they? Well, let, let, let me just explain. Despite 100,000 care worker visas having been issued in the past year, Vacancies reduced by just 10,000. So where? what happened to the other 90,000? 
Where did they go? We should be training our own people. We should not be denuding other countries of their healthcare uh, professionals. We should be training our own people. We've got well over 5 million people on out of work benefits. The government is now addressing that, but belatedly, and they need to put every effort into it. We have got to train our own people. We cannot allow the Treasury. It's not, uh, David, it's not the uh, uh, DWP, it's the, uh, or the Home Office, it's the Treasury, uh, which likes cheap imported labor. And we have got to address that. And one of the ironies of uh, what has happened recently is that um, despite uh, Brexit and our failure to exercise that control, which Brexit gave us, uh, we are importing a vast number of non-EU people, whereas EU people share so many of our values. Okay. And so, so and our, and our cultural, uh, they have cultural similarities with us. Okay. This is a very, very serious existential crisis because it's another example, David, of the people versus the establishment. And the establishment had better wake up because the people are fed up. See what happened in Ireland, in Dublin yesterday. Sir Gerald Howarth, so that's all we've got time for. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Still to come here on Talk Today, a cervical cancer warning as over 25s are urged to get checked. And a heroic crane operator rescues a local man from a burning building. Journalist Nikki Hodgson and Deputy Editor of Spike Fraser Myers are back with us to look through this morning's papers. And do get in touch, please, with all of your views. This is Talk Today, the time, 7.24. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. The amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm just, I'm just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 7.27. We'll have the papers in just a moment. But here is what is coming up in today's programme.
Convicted murderer and former Olympian Oscar Pistorius will have a chance to walk free at a parole hearing today. We'll look ahead to that just before 8 o'clock. After the election of far-right leader Kurt Wilders in the Netherlands and Argentina's Javier Millet at uh, 10 to 9, we'll be asking... Is the rise of far-right leadership across the world inevitable? And at 9.20, Talk Today's Nick Ellaby will join us live from Iceland with the country still braced for a potential volcanic eruption. But first, let's take another look at some of this morning's front pages. The Telegraph says there's cabinet pressure on Rishi Sunak to slash migration as demand for a cap on foreign NHS worker visas hits a record high. In the Express, a failure to halt migration is a slap in the face for the public. That is a, according to the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. And the mirror cries make it stop, as they claim the Tory party is breaking Britain. The journalist Nikki Hodgson and Deputy Editor of Spike Fraser Myers are back with us for a look through this morning's papers. Hello to you again. Hello. And let's start then, uh, Nikki, with The Telegraph. And this is a really concerning story in The Telegraph. Mm. Cervical screening, cancer screening, falling to a new low. Yeah, so this is a, a fall in screening rates since lockdown. Um, and uh, the head of the NHS last week had said that cervical cancer, we could get rid of it by uh, mm. 2040. It's one of those illnesses, that, diseases that we can just get rid of if we only apply ourselves. The problem is that people are not coming forward. Women are not coming forward to have their smear tests done. And apparently this is partly to do with the effects of lockdown, you know, how difficult it was to get appointments during that time. And then people have kind of not bothered to go back, even though they're receiving letters, text messages, et cetera, inviting them to go. Um, it's interesting that the, the age group that's actually worse among uh, all, all those invited is between 25 and 49. So, you know, people that, women that are meant to be sexually active, likely to be sexually active, and um, really should be going to get checked every three years. And, and of course, um, this is really important. It's one of the things we talk about a great deal. I mean, going for a smear test is, is not the nicest thing. But of course, it's really important that women do go. If you look at the numbers, just the fall off from 72% down to 68%. Do you yeah. think actually, when they're looking at um, ways to replace mm -hmm. this, one of, the, one of the big barriers I've always found is that it, it's, it's not a normal procedure to do, you know, and it's embarrassing. So if you were to roll out home testing kits, I assume that would make a huge difference in those people testing. I think it might do. I mean, there's lots of problems. We need to redesign the speculum because that hasn't been redesigned since the 18th century. Fraser's fine, he's all right. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, there's loads of problems with a kind of female healthcare. And uh, I think what's important to say about this is I think sometimes there's a reticence on the part of women because they think if they've had the HPV vaccine, they're protected. That's a good point. And actually, you're not from every kind of um, HPV element. So just because you've had the vaccination doesn't mean you can skip your smear test. And I think that's a core message that the NHS may be struggling to get out. And, and I think, Fraser, this actually, yeah. for me, goes back to a much bigger issue, which is that in COVID, we mm. locked down. We're hearing more and more from the COVID inquiry about why they kept saying they're following the science when clearly they weren't following the science. But just in terms of that, the collateral damage was all of those people who missed their, their routine appointments. Yeah, it's extraordinary. I mean, we had COVID monomania. It's as if we forgot that people ha can have other illnesses than COVID, that people have other health needs uh, than not catching COVID. I mean, one thing um, that struck me in particular in recent years, we've seen uh, women's health care or, you know, lots of, lots of different types of health care being sort of gender neutralised in this sort of push for inclusivity. I think that's actually quite dangerous in contexts like this. You know, you're talking about cervical smear tests. Often people will get letters through, um, you know, landing on their, in their house and they say, come for a cervical smear test um, or people with cervixes should get checked out. But actually, <laughs> only 40%... Aren't they women? Well, they exactly. And, uh, they're, they're women, right? But only 44% of women even know that they have a cervix, know what a cervix is. There, so it's very important that we do address it. There was a <laughs> massive <laughs> hike, wasn't there, the number of people going for cervical screening after Jade Goody mm. died yeah. from cervical cancer. And that prompted so many more people to start going and getting themselves checked and recognising mm. the importance of yeah. early diagnosis. And what we're now seeing is those numbers coming down, mm. which is a really worrying And thing. what you don't want is another celebrity being poorly to have no. to increase yeah. people's attendance, well, obviously. Exactly. And, Fraser, this leads nicely to The Sun, page 12. Kemi economy fears on COVID. This is about Kemi Badenoch giving evidence to the COVID inquiry. Yeah, and she's quite rightly saying that, you know, the economy was not really considered during this period. There was this very strange debate at the time where if you said, 
said you were worried about the economy, then you were accused of not caring about people's lives, you were accused of being callous, wanting people to die. But you can't separate the economy from people's lives. The economy is people's lives. And, you know, as we now know, with the first lockdown, we had the largest recession in the history of modern capitalism, the largest fall in output since the great frost of 1709 <laughs> destroyed everyone's crops and the Thames froze over. That was how serious the economic mm -hmm. crisis was. But everyone was living in this sort of dreamland where we thought we could just carry on in lockdown forever. Um, as long as the virus doesn't get to us, then we have no other problems. I mean, these are all coming back to bite us now, of course. We're paying it through it through inflation, through massive hospital waiting lists, through high taxes and things like that. But, you know, at the time, those of us who said this is a problem were shouted down. Yeah. This was her evidence to the COVID inquiry, and she also said that she's really <coughs> concerned about the number of COVID conspiracy theories that are still in existence, that people come up to her in the street and tell her she's part of a grand conspiracy <coughs> to infect them all. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of maddening, isn't it? And mind-blowing that people are still hooked on these conspiracy theories. And maybe it's a kind of psychological uh, problem on the part of people that can't process what happened. Almost, It's just easier to believe a conspiracy theory than to contemplate the fact that maybe somebody in their family died, maybe they did lose, you know, a huge amount of income, a job, well, don't, don't, don't you think actually what underpins all of this is actually people have lost faith in the government and indeed in the advice that was given. We were told the immunisations mm. right at the beginning, and I've been accused of this, of saying you need to get vaccinated or immunised because it will actually stop you getting it and stop you passing it on. That turned out to be nonsense because they didn't tell us at this point. So, so it, was, it was a web of lies, which either they knew about or they didn't know about. People's faith in the system has been totally eroded. My real worry is what does that also do in terms of other immunizations yeah. because yeah. people are saying well it wasn't worth having measles well, yeah. vaccine measles, yeah. measles yeah. vaccine example, back yeah. or, or you could say you know i think it's fair to say that maybe you know at various points in the pandemic we the government and scientists didn't have the full information but they never they pretended that they knew everything yeah. and so then when the facts changed they ended up looking silly but no. i think you know with yeah. conspiracy theories you have to also the lockdown has played a real role in this because it's kept people online kept people by themselves normally in normal life if you come up with some wacky theory you go to you go to the pub the next day <laughs> you tell your friends and they'll say yeah. shut up you yeah. know, come off it yeah. come off it we didn't have that for months on end and so people got into these rabbit holes social media and that yeah. spread mm. of misinformation at the pace the virus was spreading as well can i take <laughs> us to the telegraph uh again uh nikki and uh, this is uh, the surprise victory of Builders. Sorry, Fraser, oh, this, sorry, is Fraser. Yeah. this is you. Yeah, sorry, I mean, to, to say that this is a shock victory is probably the understatement of the century. I mean, even Herr Wilders himself and his party didn't know that they were going to do so well. They only booked the venue for their victory party a few days before. Um, anyone <laughs> reading, the pre reading the coverage um, of this and the build-up would have been convinced that uh, some moderate centrist uh, would have won it. Um, there was an amazing Financial Times piece <laughs> saying, like, the Dutch are in the mood for some moderation. Uh, and here we go, they um, elect uh, Herr Wilders, you know, a sort of hard right figure who's been on the scene for around uh, 25 years, um, you know, quite ex uses a lot of extreme rhetoric about Islam. But I think, you know, what this really shows is that in just about every country in Europe, people are really fed up with the status quo. Mm. People are going to take risks uh, with who they vote for. They want to hit back at the establishment and they will reach for whichever weapon uh, looks like the, the best well, well, I think that's right. And also 37 seats, I believe, that he got was the, the final result. We're starting to see this across Europe, rejection of this monolithic EU. I don't... And also, it was interesting, actually, how he changed his rhetoric. He yes. started dialing yeah. it down just before the election. So he was giving a, quite a, a tailored, tempered message by the end of it. But there's no doubt in my mind that you are starting to see a backlash across Europe, partly about migration, but also about this super centrist control. Yeah, but, I mean, do people know what they've voted for is always the question. And I don't mean to, you know, insult the intelligence of voters. I don't mean it like that. What I mean is if somebody does temper down their core messaging just before an election and maybe somebody hasn't been following politics that closely and then tunes in at the last minute, votes for that person, and then six months later, a year later, sees a kind of very far-right policy that actually they find, you know, I mean not very tasteful, you know, it's not that easy to get somebody out after you voted for them. But let's look at some of the things he, he's talked about. Leaving the EU, we know about Nexit, stopping aid to Ukraine, forcing countries out of NATO, shutting down all mosques, banning the Quran, unapologising for slavery, scrapping environmental legislation. I mean, the list goes on and on. Yeah, I mean, to me, that's just a death knell because it's not future forward in any way, 
in any way. You know, but, but saying yet, we don't want and, to care and about yet the environment. People voted for him. Yes. So, so, so what does Which that say? Which goes back to Fraser's point about the, you know, the disenchantment, the general disenchantment. Well, well the environment. I, I mean, I mentioned to to um, Sir Gerald there about mm. Britain becoming an unrecognisable country. That is what I hear from the Dutch as well. Yeah, and and I mean, immigration is a big factor, but but I, a big. I think it's worth talking about the environment as a as an issue here, um, because the you know the Dutch have had huge farmers protests. Uh, against uh, essentially EU climate laws. And the man that Wilders beat was Franz Timmermans. He was a former European commissioner. He was in charge of the Euro Europe's Green Deal, in charge of imposing many of these kind of austere climate policies. And voters have really rejected that. That is going to be a huge new fault line in the years to come as net zero starts to impact on jobs, as it starts to lead to waves of deindustrialization. People are going to say, no thanks. They're not going to tolerate, you know, just because uh, a politician says we need to hit our climate targets. People aren't going to tolerate being immiserated. So that's going to be a huge issue we, in the coming years. We're going to be debating uh, the rise of the right and, and the mm. far right uh, later on on the programme. I don't know if we've got time, but if we can very, very quickly, Fraser, have a look at the sun for these remarkable pictures of this uh, crane rescue. Uh, here we go. Um, a man on a burning building in Reading, rescued by Look this heroic crane it's operator. Absolutely extraordinary. And the and the hero was so humble about it. He says, you know, it's not your average day at work. <laughs> You're not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the, you know, had the it's, it's completely dramatic. You know, the guy was trying to get onto this uh, crane. Um, he was beaten back by the flames several times. You know, had he not made it in time, had it possibly been a few more seconds, it would be a very different story, and it would be a tragedy. Wow, that man deserves a knighthood, I think. Uh, really uh, does. I mean, he really Genuine does. bravery. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. Genuine bravery. For <laughs> yes, sorry, I mean, that for a knighthood. I'd like to think I'd be that brave, <laughs> but I'm not sure I would, to be honest. Calm under pressure, really. 65-year-old Glenn Edwards, who uh, conducted that amazing operation. So he deserves a really good retirement. I hope yeah. he had a drink. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I hope he had a drink at the end of yeah. the day. Uh, not your normal day at work. Thank you very much indeed to Nikki and Fraser. They'll be back with more papers in just under an hour. Now, though, for your news update with Emily. Good morning. A four-day pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas started at 5 a.m. this morning. The deal will allow 50 Israeli hostages to be released, as well as 150 Palestinian prisoners. Explosions were heard in the hours leading up to the start of the agreement, which will see the first 13 Israeli captives freed this afternoon. Gershon Baskin is a hostage negotiator, and he says it's a significant moment. With the return of the first 50 hostages, with an open-ended possibility of including more hostages on day five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, until all the civilian hostages are returned. It's the first day that Israelis can smile a little bit since October 7th. The police chief in Dublin has blamed lunatics and hooligans that are driven by the far right for widespread unrest and violent scenes in the city centre. Several vehicles, including a police car, were set alight during clashes with officers yesterday evening, which were sparked following the stabbing of a woman and three children earlier in the afternoon. And Amazon workers are going on strike today to coincide with Black Friday, one of the company's busiest shopping days of the year. More than 1,000 staff at the firm's warehouse in Coventry are staging a walkout in a long-running dispute over paying conditions. The online retail giant has insisted that customers will not be affected by the industrial action. Those are the headlines. I'll be back with more news at 8 o'clock. Emily, thanks very much indeed. Now you've been getting in touch in your droves with your views <laughs> and opinions this morning. We've been talking uh, about Suella Bravman saying that the net migration figures that were released yesterday are a slap in the face. And the former Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has said she believes that the government has lost control of immigration. Do you agree? Uh, David says this is extremely rich coming from her when she did absolutely nothing in her term as Home Secretary. She just talked rhetoric and spin. Yeah, Steve said immigration was the deciding factor when it came Came to the Brexit vote. That's right, it was taking back control of our money, laws and borders. And yet it's now worse than it was before. The government absolutely has lost control. And Molly says, I find Pretty Patel's criticism so hypocritical. Why didn't she do something about it? If she believes immigration is out of control, this all started during her term. And one more, Graham says, saying they've lost control is the understatement of the year. The Tories are completely lost. That sort of emphasises uh, what Sir Gerald uh, Howarth was saying as well. It's unacceptable and they need uh, to take control of this. Let's move on to some 
unpleasant news. Uh, the weather, Joe, is here. It's going to get cold. <laughs> you say unpleasant, but there's going to be loads of sunshine oh, for most good. of us might tomorrow. Be a good day, crisp and bright. Well, it might crisp get rid and of your bright bank. for most places. <laughs> yes, not so the uh, the east coast, but definitely one for coats and scarves and gloves, all that sort of thing. But not too many umbrellas. Let's have a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Yes, the weather itself is actually going to be quite pleasant. It's the temperatures that will come as a bit of a shock, really struggling to reach even five or six degrees Celsius tomorrow. Why so? Well, we've got this uh, pull of northerly air straight from the Arctic. We are going to see some showers along eastern coasts and winds will be strong in the east as well. So we've got a wind chill factor to go with that. Then by the time we get to Sunday, we've got uh, some more cloud and rain making its way in. So temperatures will start to recover a little and then things remain rather unsettled into next week. Certainly for this morning, it's a little bit grey across many central areas, parts of Wales, some patchy rain and drizzle. That's going to die away through the course of the day. We've already got wintry showers over the northern parts of Scotland, mostly over the higher ground, rain at lower levels. And some of those showers are going to work their way into eastern coasts as far south as East Anglia. But through those central areas, plenty of sunshine and increasing Increasing amount of sunshine down towards the southwest. But as I say, temperatures probably no better than around six or seven degrees Celsius for most, and that's in the towns and cities. So you can imagine after dark, those temperatures are really going to take a tumble, and we could see some minus fives, minus sixes, something like that. And overnight, a widespread frost developing through central and western areas. The wind in the east, probably enough to keep frost away, but there will still be a few showers along those eastern borders and it continues to feel exceptionally cold there. And then tomorrow, while well, the frost will take a while to lift, but after that there will be plenty of sunshine, still some showers to come in the east though. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you, Joe. Plenty more still to come, including after nearly a decade behind bars for murdering his partner. Oscar Pistorius's bid for freedom will be heard in a South African courtroom later. We'll be speaking to the spokesperson for Reva Steenkamp's family next. And remember, do get in touch, please, with all of your views and opinions. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using Excel bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. 
This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? What's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.48, now to South Africa. And Oscar Pistorius, the world's most famous Paralympian, was jailed in 2014 after he shot his model girlfriend, Reva Steenkamp, multiple times through a closed bathroom door. Pistorius has always maintained his innocence and claimed he thought Reva was an intruder. But the disgraced sports star was convicted of her murder and jailed. Today, the athlete is once again making a bid for freedom after serving half of his time. It is a bitter blow for Reva's family, whose world was torn apart after the murder of their beautiful daughter. Well, joining us now is Tanya Cohen, lawyer and spokesperson for Reva's mother, June Steenkamp. Uh, Tanya, thank you so much uh, for joining us this morning. How, how are the family feeling about uh, today and the hearing today? Good morning and thank you for having me. So obviously June is still in mourning, as you would know, uh, she lost her husband Barry in September this year. She's also had other losses, two of her personal friends dying in the past 12 months. And this is the second bid for Oscar's parole in the space of one year, the earlier one being in March. And then of course, I would have celebrated Reva's 40th birthday this year. So it's a difficult time for June. She does, however, accept that parole is part of the African legal system and Oscar Pasturis, like anybody else or any other offender, is entitled to be considered for placement on parole once he has served his minimum required sentence. Will June be in court uh, today? How does she feel about seeing Oscar Pastorius again? So it's not a courtroom, it's it's basically an office, you could say, mm. at the premises of the prison property that the parole board convenes at. So June has decided it's not in her best interest to be there this morning. She is therefore not present and um, contrary to the previous time, she just doesn't see her way clear to face Oscar Pistorius. And, uh, but she has prepared a written statement, a victim impact statement, that's being read to the parole board probably as we speak by Advocate Anadie T.R. Hofmeyer. And um, our very good friend, June's very good friend, Rob Matthews, who is the father of Lee Matthews, who was tragically killed a number of years ago and also going through a parole process at the moment, he will be reading June's victim impact statement to the press this Ta morning. Tanya, what can you tell us about that victim impact mm. statement? So the victim impact statement is the statement by a victim. And in this case, June is the victim, her being the surviving parent of, of Reva. So the victim impact statement tells the parole board about the emotional, the physical, the financial effect that the death of Reva has had on June. And then, of course, in the statement, June will give her view and opinions on her on Oscar Pistorius, you know, the profile that you want the parole board to consider. And, and just in terms of, of what has transpired, so he was initially convicted of culpable homicide. It was then upgraded to murder. He was sentenced to 13 years, five months in prison. Then the Court of Appeal, that's the Supreme Court, ruled in 2017 he should serve 15 years in, in prison. Just, just in terms of, of uh, her mother, ha has he showed any remorse at all towards the family? What, has there been any communication at all? So it's a very good question. The Supreme Court of Appeal actually said that they didn't think 
he had proper remorse. They stated that his version of what happened on that evening, they still didn't understand exactly what happened. So they don't believe, and June doesn't believe, that Octopus Stories is rehabilitated because she still doesn't believe his version. So, you know, it's 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 a difficult, uh, the parole has a difficult um, decision to make this morning. They must determine whether they do think that he is remorseful, that he is rehabilitated, and the, that he no longer poses a danger to society. But as a victim, I think it's very important for the victim to be part of the process because it also form, forms, to a huge extent, a part of their healing process. And, and just in terms of, of the family, ju- it, I mean, obviously, it will just be a, an incredibly difficult day. What, what are they hoping will be... I suppose, the best outcome for them and for the family? That's a very difficult question because I've always held the view that it's my job as an attorney and friend to prepare my clients that the offender will be released. So it's a long-term process. June does accept that at some point in time, Oscar will be released from prison. So she is emotionally prepared for that. After Reva's death, the family set up the Reva Steenkamp Foundation. What can you tell us about the work of the foundation in the, what, nine, ten years since? Yes, we're very proud of the foundation. We believe that there's such a huge demand for foundations to step up to the plate because, as you know, tomorrow is the start of the 16 days of activism against abuse. What we do is we educate, we assist um, victims with uh, obtaining protection orders, and we award a yearly law bursary um, to a final year law student. One of the, our first bursary recipient, in fact, um, is now a prosecutor at the state, and she's a co-trustee. At, I'm sorry, trustee and co-CEO of the foundation. So we believe that we are making a huge difference in being a voice for the victims of abuse. And I suppose in some ways, um, out of such terrible tragedy, comes some glimmer of hope that you can turn this into something good. Yes, and that is exactly what what keeps June going. The the, the thought that she's being Reva's voice, you must remember that Reva did this speaking up against abuse during her lifetime. So it's, 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 for June, it's, it's an opportunity to ensure that she takes the baton from Reva and that Reva's memory lives on. And that parole hearing underway uh, right now as we speak, at Tanya, could we see Oscar Pistorius freed today? Highly unlikely. The, paro- the Department of Correctional Services have certain parole policies for the release of offenders on parole. And in terms of that policy, they are not allowed to free an offender within 30 days of having made the decision. And the reason for that is that the offender must undergo compulsory preemptive programs. They must ensure that his support system is in place and so forth. So mm. in terms of their own policies, not likely with 30 days. OK, uh, Tanya Cohen, thank you very much indeed for talking to us here yeah. today. Still to come. On Talk Today, the first Israeli hostages will be released by Hamas later on this afternoon. Next, we'll be speaking to a man who spent seven weeks without knowing if his captive family members are even alive. And remember, do get in touch, please, with all of your views and opinions. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.56. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. 
for the amount of time it's taken. The number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with David Ball and Sarah Hewson. Hello, a very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Friday the 24th of November. Here with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Our top stories this morning. Families on tenterhooks. A four-day truce has started in Gaza with the first mass hostages and prisoners of Israel set to be freed this afternoon. Suella sticks her oar in. The former Home Secretary calls on the government to act now after record net migration figures, with pressure also piling on the Prime Minister from within his own cabinet. And riots in Dublin. Violence breaks out following an attack that left a five-year-old girl seriously injured. And temperatures take a tumble as Arctic air spreads in, but at least we'll see some sunshine. All the details coming up shortly. Well, that's some good news, at least. Uh, all of the front pages this morning, pretty much the same story. On the front page of the Daily Telegraph, we've got uh, Hurt Wilders, uh, who has won that election. 37 uh, MPs, I, I believe, at the last count. But also the headline, Cabinet Pressure on Sunak to Slash Migration. Um, we've also got Suella Braverman. This is in The Express, saying failure to halt migration is a slap in the face for the public. The Daily Mail pretty much reiterating that point as well. Suella leads... Tory revolt on migration. We talked uh, earlier to Sir Gerald Howarth. He was saying that actually it, it's a complete mess. The government has lost control. That's pretty much it's the sentiment. It's certainly a big headache for the government, isn't it? The government themselves saying the numbers are too high. Uh, Labour saying they are shocking high. What are they going to do about it? Also talking uh, on the programme this morning about the ceasefire in the Israel-Gaza war. It is now some three hours old and later on this afternoon we are expecting the first of the hostages to be released. We'll be hearing from the family, uh, a family member of uh, a group of hostages later on in the programme. Now though it is time for all the headlines with Emily. Good morning. The first Israeli hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza will be released later after a four-day temporary ceasefire was put into place this morning. Explosions were heard in the hours leading up to the scheduled start of the agreement between Israel and the terror group. Well, former Air Vice Marshal Sean Bell says it's a precarious but hopeful time. 
this parcel of 13 hostages, they may come in drips and drabs, they may come in a one slug, four days, 12 or 13 a day, total of 50, with the potential for extending it. And it's worth pointing out as well that there's something like 200 trucks of aid that are also included uh, in this deal. Dublin's police chief has blamed lunatics and hooligans who are driven by the far right for rioting in the city centre last night. Buses and trams were set on fire after a woman and three children were stabbed outside a primary school. Our reporter Elizabeth Hart is there. There was about 100 to 200 protesters here on the streets. They had a clash with Gardaí, who are the Irish police. There was fireworks being thrown, a, a lot of unrest on the streets and, and looting followed in a number of shops. A Lewis, which is a light tram, which travels through the city, was burnt out. Former First Minister Alex Salmond has launched a fresh legal case against the Scottish government. He's already been awarded over half a million pounds in costs after taking them to court over its mishandling of harassment complaints against him. It's reported he's now seeking three million pounds in damages and lost earnings. And Amazon workers are on strike today to coincide with Black Friday, one of the company's busiest shopping days of the year. More than 1,000 staff at the firm's warehouse in Coventry are right now staging a war out in a long-running dispute over pay and conditions. The online retail giant has insisted that customers will not be affected by the industrial action. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in half an hour. Super, thank you very much uh, indeed, Emily. So I was mentioning Hurt Wilders, obviously this election in, in the, the Netherlands, Netherlands yeah. uh, channeling his inner Donald Trump, I think, on the front page of the Daily Telegraph with that, that hairstyle. I'm not sure who had it first. That's a really good point, actually. Uh, so the front page of the Telegraph uh, shows uh, shows his you hair, um, <laughs> which is which is swept back very much uh, in in a Trump-esque style. It's a good question: who had it first? But uh, the, the the question we're asking this morning is about the far right or what is being labelled as far right. So across Europe, we're seeing a change in the governance of these countries, moving towards a right of centre party or indeed right wing parties across Europe. Hurt Wilders, for me, what was interesting was the way he changed his rhetoric. He very much was on the offensive, saying we're going to leave the EU, there's going to be Nexit following on uh, from the back of Brexit. He slightly dialled that down. He wanted to do some other things as well, like ban Moss, the Quran. He did indeed. Uh, he wants to unapologise for slavery. Uh, but you're right, he did start to moderate his rhetoric in the days coming up to the election. Whether he can now uh, form a coalition is, is the question. Uh, but we are going to be discussing uh, the rise of the right later on on the programme. Do get in touch and let us know your thoughts on that. In the meantime... Oh, do yes. you want to no, do, I was just going to say lots of people are already getting in touch, yeah. actually. Jack says it's like a set of scales that needs to be balanced. It's only natural for one side to increase if the other side is overpowering. Lex says, if politicians keep ignoring the people that they serve and represent, extremism is inevitable. It's a very scary time. Yeah, Mark says mainstream politics has become so dangerously corrupted, polarised and disjointed that people are looking elsewhere uh, politically. As I said, we will be discussing that a little bit later we on. We will in the indeed. Program. Now, Sarah has a nasty cold. Yes, and I'm jo sorry. Joe, she <laughs> needs some sunshine. Will she get it? Sunshine you can have, <laughs> definitely. Unfortunately, it's not going to be very warm. We're looking at a couple of very, very cold days. But uh, it won't be around long enough that we start to see uh, problems such as ice or fog. But uh, wintry showers for the north, yes. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, it's really been quite mild recently, so why the change? Well, that's because we've got uh, Arctic air coming down from the north. And with that, you can see the tight isobars through the North Sea there. Some very windy weather out towards the east. So a wind chill factor on top of the lower temperatures as well. But for many parts of the country, we will see some sunshine too. So through the course of the day, that cold air is filtering its way through. The southwest at the moment, seeing temperatures around 12 degrees Celsius. Those will drop as we go through through the course of the day. A lot of cloud through the Midlands and Wales to start off with some patchy rain and drizzle. Again, that will clear away 
wintry showers over the high ground of Scotland and some of those showers affecting the northeast, one or two of them also affecting eastern coasts as far south as East Anglia. So feeling bitterly cold on those coastal areas where temperatures will be in single figures. And we've got those strong winds to go as well. But through central areas should actually be quite pleasant and certainly a brightening picture out towards the west. That said, temperatures only around six or seven degrees Celsius for most. And where it is breezy, that will be noticeable. And as we enter this evening and overnight, a widespread frost through central and western areas could see temperatures dipping down to around minus six, minus seven degrees Celsius. Still those showers continuing out towards the east. And because there's a brisker wind there, we're likely to avoid the worst of frost problems. But certainly for tomorrow, uh, it will take a while for that frost to lift. But then we'll see some lovely sunshine, beautiful weather uh, through those western areas. The northerly winds still likely to bring some wintry showers or some showers to those eastern coasts, again affecting parts of uh, Norfolk and Suffolk. The wintry showers themselves mostly confined to those far north, uh, northern areas, but uh, staying quite breezy down that eastern coast, although those winds will start to ease a little bit. So as far as uh, Saturday is concerned, it will be a nice day for most. We already start to see cloud increasing out towards the west for Ireland, the southwest, and that's the cloud and rain which will start to make its way in for Sunday. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Our top story today, after nearly seven weeks of conflict, a temporary ceasefire is in place between Israel and Hamas after a deal to free hostages. It brings hope to many families who have faced an agonizing wait for news. The first group of civilians released will be made up of 13 women and children who will be freed later on this afternoon. In return, the agreement will see 150 Palestinian prisoners freed and an increase in humanitarian aid into Gaza. Well, joining us now is Ahal Bazare, whose sister Yonat was murdered by Hamas and her husband and children have been kidnapped. Uh, Ahal, uh, good to see you. You've been told sadly, that they're not going to be part of this first group. Where are you getting information from and how much information are you managing to get out of there? Um, I think we get information as much as, as we need at this stage, you know. So, obviously, we have a lady who is in charge of our case. Uh, she's uh, uh, working for the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, and she basically uh, called us last night just to tell us that, uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, my uh, niece and nephew uh, are not part of this exchange. Obviously, we were not expecting uh, my brother-in-law, the dead, to be released with them because he's not part of the deal. The deal, as we understand it, it's only for uh, women and children. And, and just in terms, uh, we were talking earlier about the fragility of this ceasefire. We heard some rocket uh, noise, some uh, some other collateral noise earlier on this morning. It looks like the ceasefire is still holding at the moment. This is, this is, I suppose, in many ways, optimistic that we have the release of some of these hostages mooted for around two o'clock UK time. Also, Hamas playing for time here. They, we, we were talking about it being a three for one uh, in terms of the exchange for Israelis and Palestinians. But just in terms of that, for every 10 Israelis that are then released, there'll be an extra day of ceasefire. Does that make you hopeful that we will see more Israelis released? You know, it's very difficult, I think, to be hopeful in this sort of an environment and knowing the enemy that you face, you know, this... ISIS-like terrorist organization called Hamas. Um, so it's really difficult, you know, because they obviously use these kidnapped civilians as some sort of a tool in the military arsenal. Uh, they have no regard to, to human lives. Uh, they use their own uh, civilian as, as human shield, hospitals as, as terror bases. Um, so when you deal with someone like this, who has a history of breaching uh, ceasefires in 2014, there was a uh, humanitarian uh, uh, ceasefire that they breached, killed uh, an Israeli soldier and, and kidnapped his body. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's just, you're just afraid to be hopeful and, you know, to build up expectations of something, you know, that the other side can then manipulate and use against you. Um, so it's, you know, it's just this sort of a roller coaster uh, 
And, and, and you know, in another uh, point, you know, my sister, the mom of these two children, you know, one, the, the girl is 13, the son is 15. Uh, she was murdered by Hamas, probably in front of them. Uh, they will be released if, if they are released, you know, as part of this 50. But, you know, the dead will be stay behind. So, you know, you just try to think what these children would face, you know, coming back, knowing that the father is still hostage and the mom has, has been murdered. So, you know, it just, um, you, know, it, it, you know, it makes me sort of uh, bewildered and heart, heartbroken, you know, for the people of Gaza, you know, that they are being uh, led by uh, manic depressive psychopath by the name of Ichia Sinwa that take them all into this uh, conflict. What, what in their right mind do they try to achieve? Okay, so they killed 1,500 uh, Israelis, murdered them in cold blood, uh, viciously in the, in the most atrocious sort of way. But what do they expect to, to achieve? Would Israel now uh, what, leave Israel and then go somewhere else? Would Israel not now eliminate Hamas? Of course they will eliminate Hamas. And of course, as part of this elimination, there will be many, many civilians that unfortunately are going to be to be hurt. Uh, but you know what? Do you expect of, of Israel to do in these uh, circumstances? There is a cancer, and when you deal with a cancer, sometimes you apply chemotherapy. As when you apply chemotherapy, some live cells are being affected, but the live cells cannot at all blame the doctor who applies the chemotherapy. They can only blame the cancer for their fate. And this is a problem here. And I just don't understand how human beings with some gray matter between the two ears uh, fail to understand that. You described uh, how very vividly that your fears over the trauma uh, that your niece and nephew have been put through, potentially having watched their mother uh, be murdered. We don't know whether families have been kept together. Uh, we don't know what kind of conditions they've been in for the past seven weeks. Uh, and as and when they are released, that's not the end of the ordeal, is it? What kind of support have you been told will be offered to the hostages once they are freed? So unfortunately, you know, Israel is um, experienced in dealing with uh, grief, you know, in dealing with uh, disasters that be befell us before. So I think there is a whole system that is going to support them. I think it would be only women nurses and doctors that are going to treat them if they medically need any, any uh, uh, help. Um, obviously, the family, you know, the grandparents are there, the aunts and, and uncles are there to support them, my dad is there to support them, but it would be a, a very uh, steep and, and difficult uh, recovery uh, process, you know, out of this trauma, you know, murdered mom, dead left behind, if, if they are together, it would be even more traumatic, you know, if they separate them again. Uh, this is the only parent that is left alive in their lives. Um, you know, they are in formative years, they are young, they are just young teenagers. Um, but, you know, we as human beings find resources and find forces, uh, sometimes from unforeseen places, you know, to make us overcome and continue with life. And how are you? How are you coping yourself? Clearly the loss of your sister devastating you're living minute to minute not knowing what is about to happen hoping for the best how are you coping um you know I, I'm, I'm trying not to think about it too much you know i i watch the news i follow i see what what is happening but i try not to run these scenarios in my head of what might they do to them, how badly they are going to treat them, because at the end of the day, it's only in my head. Uh, I don't know how they are being treated. And, you know, my imagination can say that they are feed them and look after them because they value them as some sort of a tool in this uh, military arsenal, as something that they can get something uh, in return for, like ceasefire or, or, or terrorists who are in Israeli prisons. Um, so I'm just trying not to, you know, to block and to compare complementalize it you know obviously the death of my sister is devastating the funeral and all this process was horrible we didn't even bury her on the kibbutz you know we buried her on a, on a temporary grave and then you know she will have to be moved 
uh, you know, it's just it's just uh, you know sort of a roller coaster uh, emotions. You are afraid to be hopeful because you know who is on the other side. Uh, this vicious terrorist organization that really don't care about anything, not their own people, so let alone about us. Um, and uh, you know, because of this, if you build up too many expectations, you know, and then something goes wrong, as yeah. no doubt something will go wrong here. I'm not saying that the 50 will not be released, but you know, there will be hiccups because Hamas probably enjoy this sort of uh, suffering that they cause us Israelis. Um, so, you know, you just have to take it, as you say, day by day, see what uh, there is, do with the fear, try to keep yourself um, strong and hopeful. Uh, you know, this sense is always somewhere in the heart of all of us. Uh, and, you know, hope for the best, really, and pray. Okay. Um, Ahal, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. We really hope that there is some more positive news for you mm. over the coming days, and uh, we're thinking of you and all of the families. Thank you for having me. Well, then the uh, fallout from the latest government figures on migration has left Westminster reading. The former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, called the record high figure of 745,000 immigrants last year as a slap in the face to the British public who voted to control and reduce migration. Number 10 itself confirmed net migration remains far too high. Joining us is the editor of the online newspaper CapEx, Alice Demby. Uh, what's the government going to do about it then, Alice? Uh, the problem the government has is that these figures are a result of its own policies. Um, this is not uh, due to Brexit. This is not EU migration. This is non-EU mi migrants who are coming here completely legally by by accepted visa routes created by the government. They said they would take back control and create an Australian-based, points-based system. That's what they've done, and this is the result. Um, a population the size of Birmingham coming in just two years. Um, so, yeah, the, what is the government going to do? It's going to have to seriously look again at its own visa policies and, and change them. But also, I just wonder, what on earth are they thinking? The whole point about this, we've had this huge row, haven't we, over illegal migration to this country, 44,000. We're talking about astronomical figures coming in here legally, as you rightly say. The government said, well, it's not really our fault. And actually, I think it was cleverly saying, well, the numbers aren't as bad as I expected. Yeah. I mean, what sort of message does that send out? I think the problem the government has is a lot of these people are coming to full, fulfil jobs in shortage occupations like the NHS and so on. So uh, really, this is a consequence of a completely broken labour market. So on the one hand, we have a million vacancies and jobs that people we need to do. We've also got a huge amount of people who are out of work, um, long-term unemployed. So, you know, how is it squaring all of these broken, all of these like fractures in the in the British society? This is and this mm. is the consequence. And, and when we hear all the rhetoric around stop the boats, and, and you look at the numbers in comparison, I mean that is, as Suella Braverman said, tinkering mm. really, isn't it? When you look at this, seven hundred and forty-five thousand in the year to December twenty twenty-two, uh, and this is the government that under. David Cameron talked about reducing numbers to the tens of thousands. Mm. Boris Johnson talked about numbers in the quarter of a million. Uh, I mean, in recent times, the government's tried to steer clear of the targets, and it's clear now why. I do. I mean, yeah, as you say, um, the government was elected in 2019 on a manifesto to bring the numbers down. That mm. clearly hasn't happened. Um, and, and how are voters going to trust a government that clearly fails to deliver on these promises? I think the other problem facing British people is Labour doesn't have an alternative plan. Um, Labour has no credible plan either to stop illegal migration <laughs> or to deal with legal migration. Um, so, I mean, this is clearly something voters care deeply about. It's clearly some, they want to see these numbers come down. They want a government that they can trust, and where are they going to turn? Well, I just wonder also what you made of the autumn statement. I thought Jeremy Hunt looked rather pleased with himself. He, he talked about the reduction in national insurance, not 1%, but two points off that. They did get a bounce, actually, as a result of the autumn statement. Then this comes round the corner and hits them like a bus. So just in terms of this, the Conservative Party really has to learn to be conservative, I think, if it has any chance of turning around what is going to be a landslide defeat. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, actually, the autumn statement had a lot of sensible moves in it. I think cutting national insurance, that's a, a tax cut for working people, um, raising the minimum wage, that's going to help a lot of people on very low incomes. But the problem is that people are not going to feel better off at the next election. The frozen thresholds mean that many people are paying much more tax while not being better off in real terms. And I also think that the fact that 
welfare was uprated by so much less than pensions really shows where this government's priorities are. They want handouts to people who are already wealthy while working people... But, well, really so they mooted it, didn't they? They, they? they said, well, we might actually not stick to the triple lock, and then there was a backlash, and, of course, then they upheld the triple lock. It's because they know that it's pensioners who vote for them. <laughs> exactly. Like, clear, yes, very it's clear the core Conservative voter yeah. that very much had... This was very much an autumn statement ahead of an election, wasn't it? There was an awful lot of politics mm. in, in this. Uh, but we heard from Paul Johnson of the uh, Institute for Fiscal Studies that the numbers were sort of made up, I think. Words. <laughs> I think that's one of the big problems in our politics is that so many economic decisions are based on forecasts um, and I mean even these. I mean this is the ONS figures. They've been revised. Yes, exactly. And by 139,000. So many of the figures that we base really important decisions on are just models and forecasts and predictions, um, and by supposedly independent bodies. And, and I think it really. I think it makes a kind of accountability deficit because if people are basing these decisions on supposedly independent figures, they're saying, oh, it's nothing to do with us, rather than saying, actually, these are political decisions. Um, yeah, and also he, he doesn't take into account the fiscal drag. The fact is the tax thresholds have been frozen. So, in fact, it's a sleight of hand. That's really what Sarah's saying, is that actually they're pulling in far more money into, into the Treasury and they're giving away a little bit. I didn't see anything that inspired me particularly. I think we need to see massive changes to encourage entrepreneurship and to make Britain, or at least to build on the success of what could be a successful Brexit. Yeah, I agree with you, absolutely. But I think one measure that was really positive in the autumn statement was uh, it sounds very dry but it's permanent full expensing so this is agreed uh, tax relief on investing in plant and machinery and I think that that it's a, the a biggest for businesses the biggest business yeah. tax cut in history so I do think that that's a really positive measure it's one that Labour have said they're going to stick with so you know success shouldn't we there. reduce corporation tax take Absolutely. it down to 15% I couldn't agree with you more hooray Alice Denby on that note of agreement, <laughs> we agree. thank you very much indeed. Still to come on Talk Today, a rise in children being taken out of school and forget cancel culture, the rudest comedians still get the biggest laugh. Do they? Journalist Nikki Hodgson and deputy editor Spike Fraser Myers are here to take us through a final look at this morning's papers. Do stay with us. The time is 8.24. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda is zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved.
This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational discussion You can't, discussion can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.27. We'll have the papers in just a moment. But here is what is else is coming up on today's programme. In around 15 minutes, we'll be back in Dublin for an update on the violence that broke out overnight after a stabbing that injured four people. Then we'll be asking, is the rise of far-right leadership now inevitable as two new controversial leaders win elections in the Netherlands and Argentina? And Talk Today's Nick Ellaby joins us for the latest from Iceland as the country braces for a volcanic eruption. That is coming up at 20 past nine. In the meantime, journalist Nikki Hodgson and deputy editor of Spite Fraser Myers are with us for a final look through this morning's papers. Uh, welcome back uh, to you. And Fraser, we're going to start with the mail. Uh, get ready for austerity. <laughs> Mark two, the headline, uh, as the fallout from the Chancellor's autumn statement continues. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, people will have seen a lot of the front pages um, of, about the autumn statement, hailing all the tax cuts and all the, all the goodies that Jeremy Hunt is allegedly giving us. <laughs> but in this... Re let's read the small print uh, actually penciled into that are cuts um, to public spending of the kind that we experienced uh, in the George Osborne years after the financial crisis. So be prepared for austerity 2.0. Now, in a sense, we kind of knew this was coming as soon as Jeremy Hunt was uh, installed in, in Downing Street. Um, that was one of the consequences, you know, after, after Liz Truss. It was, it was inevitable that public spending would have to fall or that he would want public spending to fall Presumably because he doesn't want to raise taxes, you know, and yeah. taxes are already at their highest burden uh, for God knows how many years. 70 years, years I think. 70 years. Yeah. Um, so this is not good. I mean, because we're paying a lot, but we're going to be getting a lot less for it is the, is the consequence. So we're going to be having high taxes and low quality services. But, but how does this play then, Nikki, in terms of the general election? Because as Fraser just said, we have the highest tax burden in 70 years. We're a high tax, high regulation, low growth economy. They had an opportunity, this is what we were just talking with Alice with, mm. to, to actually do something really radical here, to kickstart British enterprise. What, what does this mean? If we're going into austerity, this is a terrible uh, sort of look, isn't it, in terms of a general election? It's so depressing. I mean, the thing is, there's nothing to cut from public services. They're on their knees mm. as, as it is. I mean, the only thing that I can imagine Labour doing, if they get in, is saying is going after kind of, you know, high rollers. I don't know where else they're going to get the money from, you know, go after tax avoidance. Mm. I mean, that's the thing that I would do if well, I was and, in power. And yet that will be counterintuitive because the fact is the Labour Party needs to attract people Absolutely. from everywhere mm. if it's to maintain yep. that lead. And it always has a problem with, with its kind of, you know, rich voters because it doesn't serve them in many ways. Mm. So, I mean, I just don't really know where the money's going to go, come, come from because, you know, look at schools, classrooms being put together, you know, way too many children being taught at the same time, uh, teachers feeding the pupils because, you know, mm. they're underprivileged. Well, people can't afford their energy, can they? Yeah. We yeah. haven't sorted out the concrete in the schools. It's and just so depressing. The, miss the missing thing in this is, is the growth. You know, yeah. if we had economic growth, then we could afford to... Uh, we could afford decent uh, public services without increasing the tax burden. But unfortunately, it seems as if certainly the current government doesn't want to take any risks. It thinks that making any kind of bold uh, change will risk a repeat of the Liz Truss debacle. Yeah. And unfortunately, Labour is exactly the same. They actually are, are going to be even more risk averse uh, than Jeremy Hunt. They say they want to, you know, uh, basically bake the uh, predict, uh, projections and rules of the Office for Budget Responsibility into law. That means, you know, we are going to be stuck with this kind of uh, austerity for a long time. Uh, unless someone else comes forward and shakes things up. Yeah. Uh, Nikki, should we have a look at the Express? Um, mm. We were talking about 
schools and lack of classrooms. What about the lack of pupils? Middle class parents <laughs> taking their kids out of school to go early on holiday. I mean, we talked about this for years and <laughs> yes, years and yes, years, yes, it have. feels. I mean, we all know it's cheaper. Is that why? Yes, that's predominantly why, but it's also to do with the breakdown in the relationship between the parents and the schools. So this is, uh, these are comments made by Amanda Spielman, who's the outgoing head of Ofsted. And she said that the problem is that during lockdown, obviously, you know, pupils were around. Uh, Many parents didn't feel they were getting value for money if they were paying for education for their children. And as a result of that, uh, parents just do what they want now. They take them out of schools. They don't necessarily enforce dress codes. There are other kind of disciplined things going on. And whereas once upon a time, if you got in trouble at school, the parents would be the first person on the phone or down to the school to sort it out. Now they're kind of chasing the parents. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, it, it is quite interesting thinking about that you can kind of pick and choose when you send your child to school. That's what she's basically saying. And I think that's right, Fraser, isn't it? The social contract has been broken. The yeah. schools actually broke the contract by sending the kids home. Yeah. They did the lessons online. So the parents are thinking, well, if you broke the contract, I'm breaking the contract. I'm off to Magaluf. Absolutely. It's broken down on all sides. And you hear these terrible stories about children turning up now, you know, at primary school, not knowing how to, uh, not toilet trained and yeah. things mm -hmm. like that. There is a, so on, on the one hand, you know, the burden on schools is getting bigger and bigger. They're expected to, teachers are expected to be social workers yep. uh, in a, to a certain extent. But also, you're right, you know, they're not, they haven't kept up there and they haven't provided the education that children deserve either. So it's, it's just a complete The mess. thing is, I mean, I, I sort of do understand slightly why people take their kids out of school. Yes, it is ridiculously expensive to go on holiday um, if you do it in holiday time. But the thing is, you can't pick and choose when you go to work, when you have a job. <laughs> so you're not really, <laughs> yeah. you're not really starting, um, you know, you're not really setting a good uh, standard for the kids. And, and it is very difficult for a school to say, look, that week, of school yeah. you missed is so vital when yeah. they've been so cavalier about children missing a year. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, that's what's true. Changed, that's also isn't it? true. That people's yeah. attitudes to missing school mm. because, yes. because young people did. did miss so much exactly. during COVID. And it also, shifted. what does it say about the value proposition of school? This is education provided free in the most part yeah. by yeah. schools, and so therefore it should be valued rather than going early. Shall we move on to the Telegraph yes. now? Um, Fraser. Um, this is about um, cancel comics have the last laugh. They get the biggest Netflix gig, says Ranganathan. What's this about? So Romesh Ranganathan, the, the comedian, um, he's saying this usual line that gets trotted out every now and again, that cancel culture isn't real. And his reasoning behind this is that actually, you know, you look at some of the comedians who claim to have been cancelled, they have really big Netflix shows, they're actually really popular. But I don't think that disproves anything at all. It just shows that there is, you know, a public appetite for um, edgy comedy, potentially offensive comedy. I mean, he gives the example of Jimmy Carr, yeah, I was just uh, reading who this. made, who made, who uh, infamously made an offensive Holocaust joke, and says, mm. "Oh, well, he wasn't really cancelled." But if people look back to that time, what happened was that you know the culture secretary at the time, Nadine Dorries, said that they were going to bring in new laws to stop that kind of joke. So there was clearly, you know, an appetite for censorship. If, just because you know people aren't successful in cancelling a comedian doesn't mean that cancel culture doesn't exist or that the desire to cancel them isn't out there. And you only have to look at someone like Graham Linehan, you know, the writer of Father Ted and um, the IT crowd, to see the fact that he cannot play a gig anywhere. You know, when he tried to perform at Edinburgh, two venues refused to host him. He had to play a gig outside the Scottish Parliament on public land. Mm. You know, so clearly, I, I don't understand how people can still be have their head in the sand and say that cancel culture is not a problem, that it doesn't exist. It plainly does. Yeah, I, I think, actually do agree. <laughs> I agree with Fraser. I haven't got much, too much more to add because we actually agree on this. Yeah. Mm, mm, I think I think we all do. Actually. Yeah, I think we do. Um, I don't know how much time we've got. Should we talk about this new checkout opening when you're in a long list? The <laughs> things that give you a tick. You know, the things that give you a good Go on, uh, day. Oh, this is such a nice story. So it's yeah. all about the, the things where you save time and you feel really great about the saving of the time. So can you imagine, yeah, the top the top one is a new supermarket till opening when you're queuing Wait, another one. You've been queuing for ages. Yes, and then all of a sudden, <laughs> yes, oh, off you go. That's apparently that gives you the best book. But then no one actually goes to it because they're not quite sure, is it open, well, is yeah. it not open? Well, yeah, maybe they're too polite. Maybe, that, yeah. that is a test of character, isn't it? Who will dare? <laughs> yes. who, who, survival of the fittest and all that. I mean, it's quite funny, some of these things. Uh, delivery said six to eight weeks, but it turns up in two. I mean, I don't get through at that. Um, <laughs> this one is, we just thought this was bizarre. Um, plans are cancelled, so then you can get home and get your jobs done. 
Oh, yeah, no, I'm quite no. Oh, no, that's yeah, awful. You know, well, that's really, horrid. No, it's what horrid. It's horrible. No. Well, if you've got a really busy week and you think you've got no time and then something gets cancelled, you think, oh, yes. No, so I think I'll get a night for a drink. I, can get I think this is disgraceful. This is the rise of this new generation that think it's OK to message you and say, mm. by the way, I can't make lunch, which is in an hour. Yes. Oh, no, I wouldn't yes. do that. That's really rude. Well, I know people who do. <laughs> No, there's nothing good about having your plans cancelled or being, you know, ghosted or whatever it might be. <laughs> Unless you didn't want to go in the first place. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's Well, then you should be honest about that. Yeah, you, you should, know, actually. You should. Yeah. you should have friends you can say that to yeah, as well. I'm yeah, just too tired, too I can't busy. be bothered. Yeah. When you roll um, up to traffic lights, which notoriously take ages and it turns green immediately, <laughs> I always cite that one as a win. Do you? Yeah. yeah. It's a sign, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, number you know, 10 it's a bad is day nicer. when you get the red wall. Every traffic light you get to is red. <laughs> yeah, number 10 is by far the nicest. We, we both went, ah, oh, this one. Getting home when it's time for tea to find someone's made it for you. Yeah, Isn't that, that cute? Is nice. yeah. Then again, you've got more time for yourself, yeah. haven't you? <laughs> and you feel loved. So yes, extra, and you feel loved. And Sarah can do her chores. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be turning up at yours for tea. Then. Oh, that's very kind. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I got a lot of Don't chores. Don't cancel me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Nikki, Fraser, thank you both very much indeed for taking us through the papers. Yeah, now it's time for a quick news update with Emily Rose Adams. Good morning. A pause in the fighting in Gaza has started after seven weeks of conflict. 50 Israeli hostages will be freed as part of the deal in exchange for hundreds of lorries carrying humanitarian aid being allowed into the territory over the next four days. 150 Palestinian prisoners will also be released. Police in Dublin say 34 arrests have now been made after rioting and looting in the city last night, which saw buses and trams set on fire. Several Garda officers were injured, one seriously after unrest following the stabbing of a woman and three children outside a primary school earlier in the day. The head of the police there has blamed it on what he calls lunatics driven by the far right. And a parole hearing is being held for the former Olympian Oscar Pistorius as he tries to secure early release from a South African prison. The double amputee is serving 13 years for shooting his girlfriend Reva Steenkamp through a toilet door at his home 10 years ago. Tanya Cohen, lawyer for Reva's mother June Steenkamp, says Pistorius has never explained or said that he's sorry. The Supreme Court of Appeal actually said that they didn't think he had proper remorse. They stated that his version of what happened on that evening, they still didn't understand exactly what happened. So they don't believe, and June doesn't believe, that Oscar Pistorius is rehabilitated because she still doesn't believe his version. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines at 9 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. Well, Joe is here now with the weather. Joe, good news. Well, it depends how you like your weather. I mean, here we are. We're virtually at the end of November. It's going to be nice to have some cold weather, you know, a bit of a taste some of dry. winter. Could we not and have any rain? dry weather. Yeah, well, dry for most, let's oh. put it that way. Yeah, let's take a look at the details. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, much as it'll be nice to see some clear skies and sunshine, it is going to be very, very chilly. Temperatures about half of what we're used to and a bit of a wind chill in the east as well. And that's down to these closely spaced isobars uh, close to that eastern coast. Then for Sunday, temperatures recover a little as further cloud and rain moves in. And then next week, it is all looking rather unsettled, but uh, not quite as cold. So the cold air isn't actually with us completely yet. It's over parts of Scotland, still quite mild down towards the southwest where we've got a lot of cloud some patchy rain and drizzle but that'll be moving away during the day and so increasingly bright skies for those western areas what we do have though are those strong winds down the eastern side of the country bringing showers to parts of scotland and along the east coast currently we've got some sleet around whitby and scarborough and some wintry showers over the high ground of scotland and those showers could come as far south as east anglia and then of course as we go to all this, this evening and overnight and we lose the light temperatures will plummet. We're looking at minus six, minus seven in places, a widespread frost through central and western areas. The east probably escaping because there's more in the way of breeze and those showers continuing as well. But then first thing on Saturday morning, although that frost will take a while to clear, we'll see some lovely sunshine through the course of the day. And most of us get away with a dry day. But again, those showers are likely to continue uh, for northeastern parts and along eastern areas. Later in the day, the sunshine becomes hazy in the west as rain moves in for Sunday.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much, Joe. Now, as you heard in the news with Emily, the Irish police chief has said that 34 people have been arrested following violence in Dublin overnight. A five-year-old girl is in a critical condition in hospital after the stabbing outside a primary school. Well, let's cross straight to Dublin to reporter Elizabeth Hurst. Uh, Elizabeth, tell us, uh, what, what's the latest there? So in the last few moments, we have confirmation that 34 people have been arrested after last night's chaos on the streets of Dublin. 32 of those are due before the criminal courts of justice this morning. Drew Harris, the Garda Commissioner, stood out in front of the, the HQ earlier this morning and he told us that one Garda has been seriously injured and they are still trying to determine the numbers of other police that have been injured as part of the chaos. He spoke earlier on about what happened last night. We could not have anticipated that in response to a terrible crime, the stabbing of school children and their teacher, that this would be the response in, a, in effect. Uh, those filled with hate and the hate directed towards members of Garda Shikana, that they would attempt to storm through our cordon and disrupt the crime scene and then engage in violence, looting and disorder, and including some very significant criminal damage. Now Garda, Commission, now, Garda Commissioner Drew Harris also confirmed today that there will be a significant police presence on the Dublin streets this morning. He also confirmed that the five-year-old girl who was in critical condition remains in critical condition this morning, while the woman in her 30s, who is believed to be her teacher, is also in a serious condition. He also provided an update um, and said that 13 police vehicles have been destroyed. Um, rather, sorry, 11 of those were guarded vehicles, three buses and one Lewis, which is a light tram. And there was also 13 shops which were damaged and looted last night. So definitely a night of chaos for Dublin to remember. Uh, and just, Elizabeth, just in terms of the reaction on the streets in Dublin, um, what, what has been the response? Also, what's happened in terms of the transport infrastructure? It, it came to a halt last night. So there's been a lot of shock. Um, people are just devastated, you know, walking to work this morning, speaking to people on the streets. They were just, you know, standing there in shock of seeing these these trains and these buses being, you know, in cinders, really. Um, it, the Dublin bus is running, but there is uh, diversions in place. The city is trying to get back operational as possible. Now, one of my colleagues asked Commissioner Harris, should people go into the city today because you know obviously it's black friday and he said there will be a significant police presence you know you know they will be safe get in if they want and just you cannot let as he re he referred to them as thugs win so um hopefully uh the, the investigation continues and uh, we'll be we'll have more information as it comes to us Thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. Well, still to come after a political earthquake in the Netherlands. Is the rise of the right now inevitable? We debate that next. This is Talk Today. Good morning to you. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegan's about. 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk. Today it is 8.47. Now, an anti-Islam leader of a far-right party in the Netherlands is set to become the country's next prime minister. Hert Wilders is one of Europe's most controversial politicians for his statements targeting immigrants and Muslim communities. It follows a number of shock election results in the past year for right-wing populists in Argentina and Italy. So today we're asking, is a rise of the right inevitable? Well, joining us in the studio is the leader of the True and Fair Party, Gina Miller, who thinks the rise of the far right is slowly coming to an end. And we're also joined by former UKIP MEP Roger Helmer, who thinks voters have become disillusioned with mainstream political parties. Gina, that's really interesting. You think, because we are seeing this across Europe, aren't we? A yeah. move to the right. In that introduction, I said, do you think it's coming to an end? I think there's a possibility for it to come to the end if the progressives and the centre actually speak up and become more courageous. Because this didn't happen overnight. It actually started back in the 1980s. And too many leaders actually thought it was uh, something that would pass. And they didn't take seriously the underlying issues were, that were being uh, uh, fueling this and being brought to the fore. You know, it was anti-immigration, anti-Muslim, anti-Europe. More recently, it's been about culture wars, um, the threat of AI, the threat of climate change. Um, so. They haven't been courageous enough, and I think if they are, and they don't just adopt the clothing of the right and the rhetoric, then they well, actually is a chance, but they have to offer a vision actually, of the future. That's a very good point, though, isn't it? Because we've got this process of normalisation yes. on two sides here. So we have the, the centre-right adopting far-right talking it, points in order to win votes. And we've got the far right. Let's look at the example of Kurt Wilders in this last He's week. Tempered. Moderating He's, yes. some yes. more extreme views yes. in order not to repel voters. But, but so, the, so how do we know where is everyone it, everyone, Everyone's confused. But the thing is, be it um, the far right or the progressives, at the moment, they're playing for people's votes. And I think that's completely wrong because what they're doing is missing the underlying issues. And if they carry on like this, then there will be more of a rise of the right. But we've got to address... I mean, Starmer is, at the moment could come to power by just, you know, keeping his head down. But if he comes in and doesn't have a really strong, mm -hmm. hopeful vision for the future and he's just a better manager, then that's not good enough for the second half of this decade. No, Roger, let's bring you in now, if we can. Uh, there is no doubt, as I said to Gina, across Europe, people are turning to more right-wing parties. I think there is a real sense, and we talked about this earlier, that in this country, this country, in terms of uh, immigration, when you have 700-odd thousand, 745,000 people coming to this country, or indeed a city the size of Birmingham o over two years, people are saying, I don't recognise this country, I don't know, I don't like what's happening, it's too fast. And that is, I think, why people are changing the way they vote. Uh, well, I think that's a, a very fair analysis. Uh, what you've got certainly in Britain is you've got two major parties who have drifted together to the centre until you can hardly get a cigarette paper between them. Uh, they both want big government. They both want high taxes. They're both very uh, uh, relaxed about uh, immigration. 
Uh, they're both pushing um, the net zero agenda and, and global warming. Um, the two parties look like twin brothers almost. Uh, and as a result, people are looking for alternatives. Now, the left doesn't really offer those alternatives because we know the left tends to be committed to immigration and net zero and so on. Um, so naturally, uh, people look in the other direction. The other point I think is critically important. If you go back, say, 10 years ago, politicians were terrified of drawing a link between high levels of immigration on the one hand uh, and um, pressure on infrastructure, pressure on social services on the other hand. Now I think it's becoming something that is understood not only by politicians but by the general public, people who can't get to see a GP. There are too many people. And the other aspect, you've mentioned the cultural aspects of it. Uh, we've heard there are uh, 700 and something thousand net immigrants uh, in the previous year. Uh, but what we should be looking at from a cultural point of view is over a million uh, incomers coming, many of them, most of them, I think, uh, without any sort of connection to our culture. Uh, and that is threatening and dangerous. There are no attempts to integrate them into our society. Uh, Roger, you mentioned a couple of issues there, things like not being able to get doctor's appointments, etc. I and mean, if you look at the pattern from the local elections of late, what do you think are going to be the key issues on the doorstep in the run-up to the election? Is it going to be the government talking about uh, small boats and migration? Or is it about the issues that directly affect people in their pockets, the cost of living crisis, for example? Well, to an extent, it's both. Uh, I think the government would be very unwise to talk too much about small boats because literally for years and years and years, they have promised to get a handle on this whole immigration issue, both the illegal immigration and the total immigration. Every election, they promise to get, to, to get it sorted out. Uh, and what do we see? The figures simply go up and up and up. So people just don't believe those promises anymore. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. The people are very worried about the cost of living, the standard of living, levels of taxation. They don't like those things at all. The concern, and I'm, thank heavens I'm not planning a campaign for the Conservatives, because I simply don't know what they would say about these issues that would be credible and that would communicate effectively on the doorstep. I'm and, not sure you're the only one scratching no, your head no, on that one. And, Jean, Gina, Gina, mm -hmm. doesn't Roger make a really important point there, which is the Labour Party and the Conservative Party are almost indistinguishable. I don't think you can put a cigarette paper between them. What does it mean for parties like yours? Because I think people are searching for something new, for something different. Uh, they absolutely are. And, um, you know, they, you know on the doorstep, people call Labour Tory light. So, you know, that, that's mm. literally what they're saying. I want to come back on something that Roger said and there's this discussion on the migration figures. Mm. Because the fact is, when we were part of Europe, people didn't take note of it. And we didn't really know how many people were coming and going. We didn't because have that data because of free movement. Yeah. And what we discovered when we Brexited is that we needed people in all these sectors. So to have our country functioning, the, we needed to bring in more people. And that's where the politicians have failed. And I think the progressive politicians have not, we have not trained enough people here in the country. Mm. We have not invested in infrastructure. Do you remember after the financial mm. crisis when George Osborne said, you know, we were going to fix the roofs while the sun shone? Well, they didn't. No. So poor leadership is actually a big part of the, this rise in the right. And, and can I just bring you in, Roger? You, you were an MEP in Brussels. I was an MEP in Brussels as well. That is that, that Gina is absolutely right. It's a failure of governance. The whole point was to take back control of our money, laws and borders. The shockwaves across the EU this morning will be monumental because he's also talked about Nexit. If they had bothered to listen to the UK and the reforms that we wanted to the EU, we may well have stayed in it. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Many of us who campaigned for Brexit would have said, if we were only talking about a free trade area, we would support it. Mm -hmm. I remember the first debate I ever got into on this issue at the age of 16 at school, uh, I was in favour of joining the then European Economic Community because I believed it was about trade and jobs. And if it was about trade and jobs, fine. Uh, it was the fact that, that Brussels was trying to take management, day-to-day -day management control of virtually all the member states, uh, I think, that was, uh, uh, that was upsetting us. But can I just raise one other point? I'm interested that those on the left are called progressives and those on the right are called far right. So we've shifted the language to make the left 
sound good and cuddly I'm and make the right I'm not sound on the left. bad. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't like these old but, right and left well, terms, but I, I mean... I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad you're not on the left and <laughs> certainly not on the far right either. No, uh, that's, I, that's, that's why I call progressive. But, but, but you're right on the doorstep. People are, people are asking for something different. Mm. And what is really going to be really uh, interesting at the next election here in the UK is if people turn out to vote, because actually mm, that I is the biggest big growing point. figure. What I hear all the time is people are saying, what's the point? They're all the same. And so that's what we're saying, the True and Fair Party. Mm. We have to have a vision for the future that deals with... AI, the threat to the workforce, to climate change. We have to offer people lifelong learning. We have to offer them hope. Okay. And we're not doing that at the moment. Um, Gina, uh, Roger, thank you both very much indeed for that debate. Lots more still to come here on Talk Today, including we'll be live in Iceland with our own Nick Ellaby, who spent all week talking to people affected by those warnings of an imminent volcano eruption. And do keep your thoughts and opinions coming in, please. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas it possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. is Talk Today with David Bull and Sarah Hewson. Good morning. It is 9 o'clock on Friday, the 24th of November. You're with Talk Today on TV, on radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top stories this morning. Families on tenterhooks, a four-day truce has started in Gaza with the first mass hostages and prisoners of Israel set to be freed this afternoon. 
Suella sticks her oar in. The former Home Secretary calls on the government to act now after record net migration figures, with pressure also piling on the Prime Minister from within his own cabinet. And riots in Dublin. 34 arrests are made following violence in the city between police and protesters. So cold as we head towards the weekend, but at least we should see some sunshine, or some of us at least. All the details coming up. Sounds fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Well, if you've just joined us, we're talking really about the migration uh, crisis. Every single front page actually has it uh, this morning. And the question is what the government does about it. I said this earlier, actually, Sarah. The fact is we've been talking about legal migration. That's the back door. Through the front door, what, 750,000? 745,000 yeah. uh, people in uh, the last uh, year. Uh, Suella Bravman saying it's a slap in the face to UK voters. The government's admitted the numbers are far too high. But what are they going to do about it? We'll be discussing. Do, do you that. think the government rues the day they got rid of Braverman because she's on the front page of the Mail saying Suella leads she, Tory revolt on migration? They're it's now not thinking what you describe what, as a quiet exit. Not really, it, and of course, Suella talk Braverman. about noises off. Yeah, and, and you know she's saying that she's got a plan and Rishi Sunak needs to follow it. But a lot of you have been getting in touch and saying, well, she was the Home Secretary, it was her responsibility. Why didn't she deal well, with it Well, to, to put her side of it, she says Rishi Sunak wouldn't listen to anything she said about an annual cap on migration. The question is, who do you believe? Yeah, and the other big story, of course, is that temporary truce that is now four hours old in the Israel-Gaza war. And in the next five hours, we are expecting to see the first of those hostages uh, due to be released, 13 hostages due to be released uh, today. More on that now in your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning. A four-day pause in fighting between Israel and Hamas started at 5 a.m. this morning. The deal will allow 50 Israeli hostages to be released, as well as 150 Palestinian prisoners. Explosions were heard leading up to the start of the agreement, which will see the first 13 Israeli captors freed this afternoon. Hostage negotiator Gershon Baskin says it's a significant moment. With the return of the first 50 hostages, with an open-ended possibility of including more hostages on day five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, until all the civilian hostages are returned. It's the first day that Israelis can smile a little bit since October 7th. 34 people have been arrested over the riots in Dublin last night. Cars and buses were set on fire and one officer was seriously hurt. It started after the stabbing of a woman and three children outside a school yesterday. The police chief there has blamed it on lunatics driven by the far right. The Immigration Minister, Robert Jenrick, has drawn up plans to cut the number of people coming to live and work in the UK. They include a cap on the number of overseas care workers. Official figures show that net migration reached a record high of almost three quarters of a million last year. While former Conservative Minister Gerard Howarth says the government needs to address it. Oh, and I'm afraid to say, despite these people all being friends of mine, I've heard this rhetoric time and time and time again. David Cameron led the government of which I was a member, uh, promised that we would reduce the number of migrants to uh, double to tens of thousands uh, by the end of the first uh, parliament by 2015. That didn't happen and it has got worse. The ferry company Carnival, which owns P&O and Cunard, is being accused of planning to fire and then rehire more than 900 of its staff if they don't accept new terms and conditions. The Nautilus Union says the firm has no intention of engaging in meaningful negotiations and has asked them to withdraw the threat. And Nissan's confirmed that all future models of three of its electric cars are to be built in Sunderland. The Japanese firm says the production of Qashqai, Leaf and Duke vehicles will safeguard 7,000 jobs in the UK. You're up to date with the headlines. We'll have another update at 10 o'clock. That's brilliant news about Sunderland, isn't it? The fact is we need to ensure that we invest in electric vehicles, I think, and also to have it in this country is brilliant. Very positive, and it seems like a long-term commitment from them as well. Yeah, really, really good stuff. And by the way, sorry, I was just going to say, you know I said they rue the day they got rid of Braverman. Yeah. Uh, I think you're all reading my mind at home. Laura says they officially lost control when they sacked, sacked Suella Braverman as Home Secretary. I believe she could have solved the migrant crisis. Uh, Brian, though, uh, says, uh, has she lost her memory? I think this is in relation to the question we asked, which was about Home Secretary Priti Patel. <laughs> She's been speaking to Jake Berry. That interview is going to come up at midday on Talk TV. Uh, she said the government's lost control of the issue of immigration. We asked, do you agree? Brian 
says, has she lost her memory? She was one of the people that could have helped stop mass immigration, but she let it get to this point. There's a lot of finger pointing going on, isn't there, this morning? I, I mean, on all sides. <laughs> it's not me. And the former Home Secretary is yeah. from everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Another interesting point came out in the headlines with Emily. Oh, yes. I heard there Robert Jenrick drawing up plans uh, to cap the number of overseas care workers. Mm. Uh, really interesting, Emily, isn't it? Because um, care workers are where we've got massive shortages yeah. in uh, And we staff. have an ageing population. We're going to need more and more of them. And what we need to do is to make it attractive so people go into care. But that means, or care working, which means we need to pay them better pay them. and yeah. elevate them in terms of their social status as well. It's a really crucial part of the, uh, of the job uh, economy, actually. Um, let's get a look at the weather now with Joe. And I'd like to say, Joe, you were bringing us good news. The sun's going to shine for yes. some of us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the sun's going to shine. Yep, just wear your coat <laughs> really and your cold. scarf and your mittens and anything else you can find that's extremely warm because temperatures are going to be probably half of what we've seen recently. And certainly along the eastern coast, it's going to feel bitterly cold with a big wind chill. Let's take a look. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, the weather is going to be fairly settled over the next couple of days. So we're looking at mostly dry conditions with some sunshine. But if you look at the isobars close to the east coast, you can see they're close together and that's going to give us some very strong winds. In fact, we have those already. And uh, with that, a wind chill factor, which will really be quite noticeable. And then for Sunday, it turns a little milder once again as we see some cloud and rain pushing in. And next week is looking uh, rather unsettled, but temperatures close to normal for the time of year. So this morning we've got uh, cloud and patchy rain clearing away from central areas and Wales down towards the southwest. So increasing amounts of sunshine. We've already got showers over parts of Scotland, those wintry up over the high ground. A little bit sleety as we move into northeastern parts of England, then rain as we come down into East Anglia. But it's there that we've got those very strong winds. And with temperatures no better than around six or seven degrees Celsius for most of us, that is going to feel bitterly cold. And of course, as we go into this evening and overnight, clear skies mean that we'll see a widespread and severe frost developing uh, through those central and western areas. Temperatures could fall as low as minus six or minus seven Celsius. A little bit milder in the east where that wind is going to help. But again, those uh, showers will continue throughout the night. And then for tomorrow, well, those winds in the east do start to ease a little bit. Elsewhere, it'll take a while for the frost to lift. But once it does, you should see some lovely sunshine. That sunshine only turning hazy through the afternoon as the next system makes its way in. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Our top story today, a temporary truce in Gaza is holding. It began at five o'clock this morning in a deal made between the Israeli government and Hamas. The four-day ceasefire will see 50 Israelis returned, with the first 13 women and children freed at 2 p.m. this afternoon, with as many as 150 Palestinian prisoners to be released in exchange. Joining us on Talk Today is the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, Fleur Hassan Nassoum. Uh, hello to you, uh, Fleur Hassan Nassoum. Thank you very much indeed uh, for being with us. It has been seven long weeks. We heard from the hostage negotiator Gershon Baskin earlier saying today is the first time that Israelis are allowed uh, to even have a glimmer of a smile. What does today feel like with the prospect of the hostages being released? Well, I'll qualify what Gershon said and, uh, and say that we're smiling with tears in our eyes because there's still almost 200 hostages, including children, who won't be part of the first tranche of this deal. If there's going to be a second tranche, we don't even know. Uh, the truce ceasefire started this morning at 5 a.m. your time with a barrage of rockets for 15 minutes. So that's who Hamas are. They wanted to prove a point that even though we've now agreed to a ceasefire, they're going to get uh, the, last, the last word here. And so we're just praying that there could be surprises on the way. And I feel the most awful for those parents, the ones who actually think their children are coming home. And I pray to God that they do come home this afternoon and the ones whose children are not coming home. And so we're still very sad. And uh, we hope to see the scenes of these children 
uh, coming on this afternoon, just so you can uh, grasp what we're going through here. There's been now a protocol of social workers talking to the soldiers who are going to be meeting the little kids, the protocol of what to say to those little kids, because this situation is unprecedented. Absolutely right. We spoke earlier to Sean Bell, former Air Vice Marshal and military analyst. He was saying, as you rightly say, we're, we're very much into the early stages of this. This is a very difficult period of time because, as you said, there was rocket fire. The ceasefire at the moment is holding. We have, what, five hours until the first 13 hostages are released. Are you confident that things will progress uh, slowly and, and as we hope? Well, let me tell you, we thought yesterday we were getting the hostages at four in the afternoon. And then it was a delayed 24 hours because the Hamas, as part of the deal that they'd originally agreed to, refused to allow access for the rest of the hostages to the Red Cross. So this is what we're dealing with. Uh, and it's a problem. So I'm praying that, yes, that it's in their interest, actually, that um, that we should that they that we should have ceasefire i mean we know that their uh, interest is much more sinister than helping the innocent palestinians in the gaza strip their interest of course is preparing for the next part of the war um, and so we know that's what they're preparing but we also know that it's crucial for us to get back the women the children and all of the hostages home how has it been decided, Fleur, which of the hostages will be released? And of course, not all of the hostages being held by Hamas. What, what happens to them? Well, that's a really, it's, it's part of the dilemma here, because first of all, Hamas itself is saying that they don't know where all of the hostages are. You have to understand that the terror tunnel network that they have is bigger than the London Underground. So it's almost impossible. Certain hostages have been taken by Islamic Jihad. And a week ago, they released two pictures of a woman, an elderly woman and a young child saying, we've got them, we're going to release them. That child happens to be the son of a lady that I know who for 48 hours thought her son was coming home until she realized they were just playing cruel psychological warfare. And so I don't know if they know where everybody is. Um, and there's also a rumor that some criminal elements in Gaza have taken some of the hostages uh, for other reasons. So it's God knows what's going on there. All we know is that as many hostages as we can get out, uh, the quicker that we can, the better. And, and it, it, Sorry, just to interrupt, is there, is there a real concern that Hamas is going to play Israel? So we've said these hostages will be released. For every 10 more hostages released, there'll be an extra day of ceasefire. Hamas is going to try and use that to its advantage, isn't it? Absolutely. They're going to drag this out for as long as they can. Then <coughs> they, they're going to trick us. They may give seven, and then what do you do? Do you start war again because they gave seven and not 10 or not 12? It's such a difficult situation. You're not dealing with people who are honest in any shape or form. Their brokers are not honest. And so we really don't know what we're getting here. All we have is the hope that today some families will be coming home from the Gaza Strip. Flair Hassan Nahum, uh, the Deputy Mayor of Jerusalem, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a quick update on that developing story in Ireland. Police have confirmed that 34 arrests have been made following violence in Dublin. Protesters clashed with police in the wake of a knife attack outside a primary school which left five injured and a five-year-old girl in critical condition. Reporter Elizabeth Hurst joins us from Dublin now. Uh, Elizabeth, we've had an update from police in the last hour. What's the latest you can tell us? Yes, yeah, so... Guard Commissioner Drew Harris has confirmed there will be a significant Guard policing operation and presence in Dublin City today. He confirmed that 32 people have been arrested and will be before the courts. Um, rather, sorry, 34 people were arrested, but 32 will be before the courts today. He labelled them as thugs, but ensured that said to Dublin, Dubliners to get out into the city, he can't let them win. We also heard that one Garda has been seriously injured and it's still to be confirmed about the number of other police who have been injured in last night's um, riots. Now, Drew Harris spoke to us earlier on. He, he was speaking outside Garda HQ earlier on. And he also an issue, issued an update on uh, the victims of yesterday's attack on Parnell Street East. 
Uh, a five-year-old girl is still in a critical condition, while the woman in her 30s, who's believed to be her teacher, is also in a serious condition in hospital. The Taunashta Michal Martin has been speaking in the last few moments until the press conference, and he also echoed that he has been shocked by the events of last night. So um, investigations are ongoing. There was also significant damage to premises in Dublin. Um, 13 shops were damaged. There was 11 guard or police vehicles were destroyed, three buses, one Lewis, and just, just chaos overall in Dublin last night. And of course, um, confidence is paramount here. It's Black Friday today. Do people feel safe to venture out, do you think? <sighs> Look, on, the Guardian Commissioner, Drew Harris, was very keen to stress that there will be a police present. It will be significant around the city today. They want to ensure that the likes of what happened last night doesn't happen again. Um, it's Black Friday, as we know. You know, shoppers were supposed to be heading to the shops, but he echoed that, you know, we need to keep Dublin safe. We need to keep it people on the streets and to get out if they want to, as we can't let these thugs win. Elizabeth, how's there in Dublin for us with all of the latest on that developing story? Thank you very much indeed. Still to come here on Talk Today, we're going to be live in Iceland, where locals are being warned that a volcanic eruption could happen at any time. We'll be speaking to our correspondent, Nick Ellaby, who spent all week in the country. And do keep getting in touch with all of your views and opinions, please. The time, 9.16. Do stay with us. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this is important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas it possible a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.20.
Iceland remains abraced for a volcanic eruption that could blow in just uh, a few minutes or with just a few minutes' notice. Those reports come as some volcanic seismologists predict that we could be witnessing the beginning of an active period for decades. Well, Nick is there in Iceland uh, to tell us more. Uh, Nick, you've been in Grindavik, which was evacuated, then had its warning downgraded. What does that mean for families? Are they in limbo? Morning, Sarah. Morning, David. Yeah, I mean, those families are still in this nightmarish limbo, unsure when they're going to be able to return home, when an eruption will be. But the good news with the downgrading of that warning from emergency to danger is that what the experts are saying here in Iceland is in the town of Grindavik itself, which is 15 kilometres down this road behind me, the likelihood of an eruption in the town, which is what was first feared, is now less likely as that magma, just some 800 metres under the surface, is hardening. But authorities are saying that an eruption is still likely, probably some four kilometres to the northeast. And, and what that could uh, bring is, is kind of lava flows down potentially into the town and also maybe another thing people are worried about here is this power station so we're just at this checkpoint we've seen a number of lorries go past and they're kind of hurriedly building this huge horse shaped uh, horseshoe shaped wall around the power plant because it heats and provides hot water to 30,000 homes here in the southwest part of Iceland and if the lava hits that the authorities have got a massive problem on their hand in terms of the town itself we visited it over the last couple of days and Geologically, it's absolutely stunning, but terrifying for the people who live there. There's this massive crack that runs all the way through the town and it's destroyed some 20 houses, probably not people not able to return to those. There's about 3,800 people living in Grindavik itself. And, and it's just, you know, the steam rising out of the, the crack is from the sewer system and the heating pipes, the under underfloor heating pipes that they provide the heating and hot water for all the homes. and they've been shattered so that's going to take a long long time to sort out maybe 18 months before people can go back and live there but the great thing that I've been seeing here in Iceland is because it's a difficult place to live and it's the people versus the elements the sense of community spirit is huge here at this post behind me we've been here uh, in the mornings doing these reports for you and they're, they're just volunteers from different parts of Iceland pitching in uh, they've got other jobs we spoke to a computer scientist yesterday who spent all night in his car at the checkpoint and then went to the university to do his classes in the morning. And we, we spoke to another search and rescue volunteer yesterday in Grindavik itself from North Iceland. And he just got in his car with two friends and drove down and offered to help. And we spoke to him yesterday, Fridjorn Sigurvinsson, and he told me about the community spirit in Iceland and, and why everyone pitches in and helps each other. I think it's like because we are not that many, you know, we are only almost 400,000 people that live here in Iceland. And uh, we come, all of us come from like small communities. Uh, so my community, for example, is like 1,900 people. And uh, when times get tough, we stick together and uh, we like to help out. You know, we have to have, uh, help the neighbor out. And I think uh, during our like our culture, uh, when when in the past days, when the winter was really hard and and farmers had a hard time, that uh, something that just was built in our in our uh, societies. So community spirit's very, very strong here in Iceland. Everyone, you know, offering accommodation and help to the people of Grindavik who've been displaced. And, you know, it's just been really fantastic to see. The other thing I've spoken to experts here about is, is the concern, because this part of southwest Iceland is now, there's basically Iceland is one big volcano. And depending on who you talk to, there are 32 more or less different systems. But these volcanic systems here on this peninsula were dormant for 800 years and then in the last three years have been active again and there are concerns that other areas on this peninsula which is has Reykjavik the capital at the top could see more cracks open up like in Grindavik and a professor of geophysics at the University of Iceland told me he's concerned that they could reach the outskirts of Reykjavik which would then displace more and more people so people in this part of Iceland the southwest tip of Iceland are getting ready for decades more activity and potentially more problems but Iceland Tourist Board do remind us that the country is still safe to visit. It's, it's quite localised, this problem. And I tell you what, we've had an incredible time and I will be coming back here on my own time because the country is stunning and the people are wonderful. They all speak great English as well.
Um, Nick, it looks like a, a brilliant country to go to. I echo that. I've always wanted to go. What time is it there? Because you don't get much daylight, do you? No. So, I mean, the days are getting shorter here. So sunrise this morning it is 10.25, uh, but it's the same time. We're on the same time zone as you. So sunrise today is just, just before half 10, and then wow. it gets dark again at 4. And there was us complaining about <laughs> our short days. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, Nick, stay safe, look after yep. yourself, and uh, obviously our thoughts are with everyone there in Iceland as well. Thank you very much indeed, Nick. Well, that's all from us here on Talk Today. Jeremy and Nicola are back on Monday at 9 o'clock. Right, Kevin and Alex are up next. Have a great day, have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.